morning, everybody. It is 7 o'clock coming up on today's programme. Brexit is back. We're talking all about that. Plus, how much do you trust your pharmacist? And we'll be joined by the Health Minister, Dame and Andrea Ledson. We will. Plus, the bulldozers move in around the soon-to-be-demolished spa at the home of Captain Tom's daughter. There we go. I've forgotten my watch today. I'm oh, going to be no. all discombobulated. Yeah. Let's see how it goes. It's Wednesday, the 31st of January. The pharmacist will see you now. We'll tell you what ailments you can now get treatment for without seeing a GP. Brexit red tape. Could new customs controls coming in today force up the price of food for British consumers? Big day at the COVID inquiry as Nicola Sturgeon prepares to give evidence where they're live. Extreme weather warning after the storms. Now the sun in the spotlight as MPs say 10,000 people could die as a result of heat waves in the UK. I like to be in America. Okay by me in America. Everything free in America. For a small fee in America. Nothing free. Tribute to the Broadway icon Chita Rivera, whose career spans seven decades. She's passed at the age of 91. Man's joining us as well this morning. It's great to see you. Why? Well, we're asking here on The Breakfast Show this morning, how much do you trust your pharmacist? Pharmacies will now be able to treat seven common conditions without you needing to see a doctor. That's right, isn't it? Uh, if you have any of these ailments, here they come. You no longer have to go to the doctor. You can get treatment directly from your pharmacist. And if you're not sure what impetigo is, it's a very contagious... Um, condition. It's a mild skin condition. Sinusitis there, sore throats, earaches, infected uh, um, mozzie bites and the like as well. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, yeah, infected uh, insect bites, yeah. yeah, as well as urinary tract infections that infects women under the age of 65 because over the age of 65 and women can be a little bit more complicated so they would be told to, to see the GP first but it is positive news especially for many people who struggle to get those on the day GP appointments I've definitely been in the position where you call at 8 a.m you're in the queue with dozens of other people all trying to get uh, a GP appointment they are hoping that with this new pharmacy first scheme with patients not needing to go to the GP first that it could open up around 10 million million GP appointments each year. So it is great news for, for the industry. To that end, Chief Exec NHS England has been talking about it. We need to make sure that people can access GP appointments as quickly and easily as possible. And part of the way that we can do that is mean that those people who've got uh, more straightforward conditions can go and get the care and treatment they need straight from a highly skilled pharmacist in their local community pharmacy. The thought is that around 8 in 10 people live within around a 20-minute walk of a pharmacy, which means that they will be able to pop in if they have any of these common conditions. But with most of these stories, the real issue seems to be with the money and the funding. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has backed this and says that they will be providing around £645 million in funding support. However, we, had heard, we have heard from other representatives of associations that are warning that many family-run pharmacies are already struggling, a uh, loss of around £1.2 billion. They're facing staff shortages, uh, struggling to get medication in many cases as well, and say that the money they received is not in line with the high prescription costs they're About facing. So 50% less than what they actually need yeah. is what they're saying. For now, Shaman, thanks so much indeed. Let us know your thoughts on that on the breakfast show here on Sky News this morning. What about this one? Post-Brexit checks on food, plant and animal imports from the EU come into force today. Meat and dairy, fruit and veg and even cut flowers will require specific health certificates. The cost to British businesses could be hundreds of millions of pounds annually. Pushing up prices, our business correspondent Paul Kelso reports. At New Covent Garden Market, they're gearing up for Valentine's Day. But the course of true love and free trade may not run smooth this year. From today, for the first time, imported cut flowers face Brexit border checks. Valentine's Day is crazy. It is one of the biggest, biggest days of the floristry calendar, and it's worldwide. So um, flowers are shipped through Holland everywhere. Um, so, I mean, our borders are now causing us an issue with that. 
To pass British customs, imported flowers now need a health certificate signed off by a European plant inspector. These new rules mean that some of the most popular flowers, orchids, chrysanthemums imported from Europe, will need paperwork and, in time, checks at the border. The rules have already been delayed five times in the last three years. But for this trade, eight years after the vote, Brexit isn't done. It's only just beginning. It's not just flowers. Food imports, including cheese, dairy and eggs, and chilled and frozen meat and fish, for which the UK relies heavily on EU imports, are also affected. The government says the checks will prevent pests and diseases like swine flu, but admits this new red tape will cost businesses £330 million a year and increase food inflation. I know this is absolute anathema to the current government, that we should sit down with the European Union negotiate a comprehensive veterinary agreement based on alignment. Uh, that would wipe away this problem overnight, remove all the costs. It would also significantly resolve the issues uh, in relation to goods moving to Northern Ireland. Officials say they'll be pragmatic and do not expect disruption. But the reality of Brexit is trade barriers at the border. I thought Brexit was done and dusted. You could be excused for thinking that, Kate, but it's only just begun at the border. Um, these controls at the border, this is on EU imports coming into the UK. Anything coming out of the UK to the EU has been facing customs controls from day one, which day one in Brexit terms was this day in 2020. Um, they've been delayed and delayed and delayed because the government was concerned about disrupting food supply. It was concerned about the cost of living. We've had COVID, we've had Ukraine. They finally brought them in, but this is the nuts and bolts of Brexit. We chose to leave the customs union and the single market a hard Brexit. The price of that is controls at the border. Taking back control of the border means being able to introduce our own rules, perhaps diverge from the regulations in the EU, do new trade deals. But the reality of that for people trading, for people trading into the UK, for companies that are bringing stuff in from the EU now, is they're facing these costs. And today is just paperwork, and we say just paperwork, you're going to need documentation, health certificates for plants and food, as I was talking about in the report. But it's not just filling in a form. This needs a plant inspector to go to a warehouse twice a day in Holland to check all those flowers, check they haven't got um, mites in the uh, leaves that could bring pests into the UK. That's what it's about, controlling. It's going to need vets to go and check every herd of goats or sheep or cows that's producing cheese that's going to end up here. And that costs a couple of hundred quid for each of those certificates, another 40 quid possibly for the checks at the board. And all of this is and building. Delays. And delays potentially. If the paperwork's not right, it won't get in. Now, officials are saying today, today might be the best day to come through the British border because they're going to be pragmatic. They're not going to slow things down. They're going to let traders get used to this new paperwork but it is all building in cost. And you talk to many businesses and they say, this is cost without benefit. The rules haven't changed since we left the European Union. We're checking for exactly the same stuff that's being checked the other side of the border, sometimes just six hours before it arrives. So there's frustration. The government say it's important for biosecurity, keeping the UK secure, but it is Brexit finally taking effect. Let's see what happens during the coming days and weeks. Paul, thanks very much indeed. You mentioned January 2020, uh, just as Brexit was starting. Uh, uh, forgive me, the, um, the lockdown. Yeah. Yes, yes. Focus now on Scotland with regards to the inquiry. And it's Nicola Sturgeon who will today give evidence at the Scottish Covid inquiry in the toughest test of her stewardship of the pandemic so far. It's looking at the decision making between early January and late March 2020 when the first national lockdown was imposed. Our Scotland Scotland correspondent Conor Gillies has more. This has become an inquiry that has become engulfed in a scandal over deleted WhatsApps. We know the former First Minister has wiped all of her pandemic-related exchanges on that platform. Now, her defence is that she did not routinely conduct government business on WhatsApp and that it was Scottish government policy uh, to uh, clean up, essentially, those messages and delete them as ministers went. But that has angered those who lost uh, people during coronavirus, and they will be waiting for answers on that here today. Questions also around claims of Nicola Sturgeon running the Scottish government in a presidential style, where essentially a tight 
cast list of people came together to make decisions before they went to Cabinet, but essentially those decisions had already been made. Examples being of so-called gold command meetings, where a very small number of people were in the room to make those decisions, and no minutes exist of those meetings whatsoever. A militant group that's among those suspected of an attack that killed three US soldiers is pausing operations to prevent, I quote, embarrassment to the Iraqi government. The Iran-lined group, Qatayya Hezbollah, is one of several factions that American officials believe may have carried out the drone attack on a US airbase in Jordan. Joe Biden's confirmed he's made up his mind about how to respond, but hasn't outlined what that will involve. Mark Stone has more. Elon Musk is threatening to move the tax of base of his company Tesla after a judge in Delaware blocked the board from giving him a $56 billion pay packet. He's polled his followers, asking whether to move the company from where it's incorporated from Delaware to Texas, where the company's headquarters is. So far, the vast majority have agreed he should. Emails released by the BBC show how Martin Bashir told colleagues professional jealousy was to blame for allegations that he secured an interview with Princess Diana through deceit. The journalist wrote the message in 2020, months before a BBC Panorama interview exposed the scandal surrounding his infamous 1995 interview, in which she said of her relationship with the then Prince Charles, there were three of us in this marriage. A damning report found that Bashir had faked bank statements and showed them to Earl Spencer, Diana's brother, in order to gain access to the princess. Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan and his wife have both been sentenced to 14 years in prison for corruption. The pair are accused of retaining and then selling state gifts when he was in power. It comes a day after another special court convicted Khan for leaking state secrets. We're seeing increasing numbers of heat waves here in the UK, of course, and 2023 was the hottest year on record. Well, Ivor Bennett's now looking at whether we're ready for what's being dubbed the silent killer. The fear is we're under attack, and the weapon is the weather. Extreme heat no longer a freak event, but seen as a fixture of our summits, which MPs say will prove a silent killer if the UK doesn't act. It's here, it's a present danger, and it's coming at us quite quickly. And so we looked again at how resilient is the UK to the impact of higher temperatures. And we found that there is really a lot of work that needs to be done. Up to 10,000 people a year could die if nothing is done, according to the Environmental Audit Committee, with the elderly and vulnerable most at risk. And they say the threat is to both physical health and mental. It's normally this kind of weather and the gloomy winter that's associated with causing low mood and depression. But MPs are warning heat can have the same effect too, with potentially deadly consequences. According to their report, when the temperature goes from 22 degrees to 32 degrees, the suicide risk in the UK doubles. So what can be done? One suggestion is to name heat waves, like we do storms, to increase public awareness of the dangers. It's clear that Britain still thinks of itself as a cold country that celebrates periods of heat by talking about going to the beach and eating ice cream, when in actual fact it's an extreme weather event that leads to thousands of deaths. We have to alter our perception. There are also calls to retrofit homes and offices to make them cooler. An overheated workforce costs the economy an estimated £60 billion a year. But the biggest fear is the cost to life. Ivor Bennett, Sky News. Let's talk about a Sky News special investigation now. Ready to gamble crypto casinos. Sanya, say, what does all that mean? So I found that there are hundreds of accounts that are ready to gamble for these crypto casinos. They're a type of illegal casino in the UK that uses Bitcoin. Now, Basically, there are blocks in place that stop you usually being able to access them. But for as little as £8, you can buy an account, log in and start gambling. A lot of people think that there needs to be more scrutiny on social media companies. But also, when I spoke to Caroline Harris, the chair of the Gambling Related Harms APPG, she said scrutiny also needs to be applied to the casinos themselves. I wish that it was something I wasn't anticipating, but knowing what I do know about that kind of environment, 
I think it was only a matter of time before we saw these things happening. There seems to be a mindset throughout the gambling industry that because it's gone for so long unchecked, that there is no reason to have any consideration about what is right and what is wrong. You know, there's no moral compass there. We've seen it in mainstream gambling and now we've seen it in crypto. That's a big worry for those that are concerned about gambling addiction, either for themselves or for their families. Definitely. And Caroline, part of the all-party parliamentary group, they look at the gambling-related harms and they're very worried about crypto casinos because they lack a lot of the safeguards that you see in the regulated in industry. There are very little time limits or wages, for example, like that. I went and spoke to the casinos and to the social media companies to hear what they had to say. You did, actually. Should I read it? Why yes, don't please I read do. it? OK. TikTok, Reddit, Discord... What's Discord? It's a messaging board used by video gamers. OK. And Meta, we know what that is. All removed the accounts after being contacted by Sky News. The social media companies said the safety of users is the top priority and that their community guidelines do not allow the promotion of gambling services or activities. After being approached by Sky News, Stake.com said it's aware of attempts to evade our industry-leading controls by a variety of means. The spokesperson added that Stake has the strongest controls in the industry and they work with regulators and law enforcement to stop fraudulent attempts to get onto their site. Stake.com is not available in the UK and we invest in detecting and preventing problem gambling. Where can people find out more about this? On the website and on your app. OK, fantastic. Thanks very much. Thank you, you so did much. a good thing there. Well <laughs> done you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Chita Rivera, the Broadway star whose career spans seven decades, has died at the age of 91 following a brief illness. I like to be in America, OK by me in America, everything free in America, for a small fee in America. From hitting the big time in the original production of West Side Story in 1957 to Chicago and Kiss of the Spider Woman, she's been described as a true Broadway icon. Rivera was nominated for 10 Tony Awards, winning twice. Actress Catherine Zeta-Jones called for the lights to be dimmed on Broadway in memory of Rivera. Taking to social media, she said, there are no words to tell you what an incredible impact you have had on my life. And Lord Lloyd Webber said, farewell, Cheetah. You redefine the world's theatrical legend. Quick look at the weather for you. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Wet and windy conditions will sweep into Scotland overnight with rain spreading south through the day. Yellow wind warnings are in place for the northern half of the country with storm force winds expected in the far north and gusts in excess of 50 miles an hour for northern England. The bulk of the country will be dry overnight with a frost in areas where skies clear for any length of time. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Pleased to say Andrea Ledson's with us this morning. Um, Dame Andrea Ledson, forgive me, uh, Minister for Public Health, good to see you. Ah, pharmacies, going to be doing more, tell me. Yes, really exciting news story today. We're launching Pharmacy First and I'm pleased to say over 90% of all community pharmacies have opted to sign up to it. What they'll be doing is, in future, any patient with a common condition such as a sore throat, sinusitis, impetigo, a urinary tract infection, will be able to go to their community pharmacy to receive not just advice but also treatment and prescriptions from their community pharmacist. That's expected to potentially free up to 10 million GP appointments each year, allowing GPs who do a fantastic job to focus on the more complicated cases. So it's brilliant for patients, brilliant for the pharmacy sector who are getting funding of 645 million for this over two year period. Uh, and of course, it, it's, it's also fantastic for the whole primary care recovery. Slight issue with the funding, you brought it up, 645 million is what the government is making available. Um, <clears throat> we've been hearing from the Chief Executive of the Association of Independent Multiple Pharmacists saying 
Uh, they are severely underfunded to the tune of 1.2 billion. So there's a 600 million pound shortfall there. Well, the government already provides 2.6 billion pounds a year to the community pharmacy sector, and and the 645 is specifically for pharmacy first. Um, pharmacists do a huge amount already in, for example, providing blood pressure checks, which saves lives, uh, providing oral contraception to young women so that you can get your oral contraceptives over, uh, from your pharmacist rather than waiting for a GP appointment. So they already do a fantastic amount to support patients. And what we're finding is that as a result of Pharmacy First, which they didn't have to sign up to, brilliant news that over 90% have signed up to it, um, what that will do is it will increase footfall through the pharmacy sector, which is thriving, by the way. You know, four in five of us live within a 20-minute walk of a community pharmacy. And so what we're seeing um, as, as the UK government is a thriving sector that can do more to work to the top of their training. But to my point about a £645 million shortfall, 2.6 billion per year um, is provided to the community pharmacy sector. The 645 million is the extra to just pay for the pharmacy first but contribution. But there's a shortfall of 1.2 billion. My, my maths is terrible. But if you uh, offer them 645 million... It's... Plus 2.6 billion. Yeah, so why are they suggesting... I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure about the, the figures that have been provided there. But I do want to make the case that the pharmacy sector is thriving. Under our NHS workforce plan, we will be increasing by 50% the number of pharmacist places in training. Um, since 2010, we've already seen a 61% increase in the number of pharmacists from 2010 okay. to, to now. So actually that the sector is doing well. We obviously keep a close eye on it. OK. Uh, given that the pharmacists are saying they've not got enough money, but they are going to be doing quite a lot of the heavy lifting in order to make more space available for GP appointments, would the government be prepared to look again at the funding for them? Well, we're about to start the discussions for the 24-25 funding envelope. Is that a yes? Uh, well, no, we're about to start those discussions. And what the government always seeks to do is to ensure that there is a good and fair and good value for taxpayers' money contribution to the community pharmacy sector. But, of course, they are businesses, um, you know, many open and some close each year. But what we're seeing is a thriving sector that has the full backing of the government. And I'm delighted okay. that over 90% of them have opted, have chosen you said. You said. to sign up for okay. Pharmacy Talk First. Talk to me about Brexit. I thought Brexit was done. Yes, four years ago we left the EU, absolutely. So what's happening? Oh, you mean the, uh, the, the plant checks? Yes. Yeah, so essentially that is one of the, the points about leaving the single market is that there is increased checks at the borders because you're not in the single market. That's absolutely known about ever since 2016 when the decision to leave the EU was made. But the point is that since leaving the EU, the UK has been able to sign up to, I think, 70 trade deals, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is the area of the world from where up to 50% of global growth is expected to come in future decades. The UK is the first European nation to have signed up to it. It will be hugely beneficial for us. So whilst we are, yes, still trading enormous amounts with the EU, we have opened up other opportunities for UK businesses, exports and imports but, too. Yeah, but the government has acknowledged that it's going to cost, uh, cost businesses in the UK an extra £330 million a year. So, again, there are big opportunities from free trade deals. We, we have huge trading arrangements with the United States. As I say, we've signed up to the T, this Trans-Pacific Partnership to other today, free trade though, deals. Well, actually, businesses always face the cost of doing business. Businesses knew at the time of Brexit that in leaving the European single market, there would be additional checks at the border because, by definition, we were no longer in that single market. There was no surprise about that. I can certainly remember as business secretary myself back in 2019, every day meeting with businesses, roundtables, to help them to prepare for us actually leaving the, the European Union and, and to understand the additional checks that would be required. So businesses are used to the costs of doing business. I understand that today is a big news story because it's something that finally has come home to roost. But the fact of the matter remains that businesses have huge opportunities with other parts of the world, which are the direct benefit of us leaving the European about, Union. With all due respect, it's not about it being a big news story. It's about the small businesses that it's going to impact. We're speaking to a florist later on who 
will not be able to afford the flowers coming from Holland because she can't afford the checks that are going to have to be done and the increase in flowers as a result. And as I say, leaving the single market was always going to have implications. But what would you say to her and those trade. like her? Um, so what I would say, I mean, I've had many constituency cases over the years of people who've changed their trading arrangements with the European Union as a result of different frictions, whether it's postal cost changing, whether it's um, border so controls and Europe, so on. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that businesses need to adapt to meet the changing environment. There are huge opportunities so from the rest do? of the world. Well, I don't know her particular circumstances. She can't afford the flowers that, and the extra increase that it's going to cost her to get the checks before she brings them over from the Netherlands. So there are many parts of the United Kingdom that are flower growers themselves, and there are other parts of so the world So she shouldn't buy from Europe, that's well, what you're saying. I'm not saying that at all. I'm well, just you saying, are. I don't know her exactly circumstances. What you're and obviously, what some businesses will do is continue to trade with the EU and absorb those costs, and others will choose to find access from elsewhere. But I think the key point is the UK has big opportunities from leaving the EU. Looking aside from um, straight trading arrangements in, in the sort of agricultural and, and floral and so on area, there's the whole opportunity for financial services, the jewel in our crown, okay. the Edinburgh reforms have improved our ability to compete with the rest of the okay. world. And of course, in, in the medicine space, we have our own medicines regulator. It's not going to help this florist though, is it? But uh, we'll talk to her later on and put your points to her okay. and see what she has to say. Let me ask you about Stormont before I let you go. How are you feeling about a united Ireland? Sinn Féin are telling us they can see it in the far distance. Well, I think Northern Ireland is an integral and critical part of the United Kingdom. I'm equal parts Brexiteer and unionist, so I absolutely will do everything possible to ensure that Northern Ireland remains part of the UK internal market, that we respect totally the challenges in Northern Ireland. And I think that what the government has done in providing a package of support to Northern Ireland that has enabled um, the DUP party leaders to come together and decide to reform the Stormont Assembly is brilliant news. OK, and, so yeah, call your jets, Mary Lou Macdonald, because it's not happening, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. in, my, in my world, I would go a very long way to make sure that didn't happen yet, that Northern Ireland is an integral part, a much-loved part of the United Kingdom. OK, it's good to see you. Thanks, Thanks very much indeed for Thanks taking the time. Thanks very much. So, as far as the situation is concerned uh, with Stormont, I know that there is going to be more discussion with that over the uh, coming hours and days. We're going to be hearing from the uh, Prime Minister. The attention, once again, turning now to Westminster MPs. We did see that agreement in the early hours of the morning at uh, Stormont yesterday. Um, any suggestions that a deal can be done and power sharing once again start has to be ratified, of course, by uh, Westminster. And as I was saying, uh, Sinn Féin suggesting that they could potentially, Amanda, see a united island somewhere on the horizon. Basically, Andrea Leadsom saying, over my dead body. Well, yes, indeed, pretty strong. She said integral part of the UK, didn't she? Um, so this is uh, Mary Lou Macdonald, the, pre the president of Sinn Féin, last night telling Sky News the days of partition are numbered. Of course, we know that that's one of the founding principles of Sinn Féin, um, getting uh, Northern Ireland and Ireland back a, a, as a united uh, country, which obviously is not... Um, something that the UK government would like to see as a result of getting the independent executive elected by the people of Northern Ireland back up and running um, in Stormont, which of course has been the driving goal of this. But clearly, for the first time, as a result of having uh, Stormont back up and running, there will be a, a Sinn Féin First Minister. So clearly that is how they see it. But I think overall, as we were hearing from Andrea Led Ledsom, that's not the point about this. Um, the idea is about getting um, elected representation back for the people of Northern Ireland, which should strengthen the union, which is obviously what the government is hoping to achieve. She talked about offered. Brexit as well, of course, but I just want to push you on that point. I mean, that's the sort of comment that could see all of that hard work that's been done um, go by the wayside. 
It's, it, I mean, it's it, in terms of the, the, with the DUP. Uh, yes. With the yeah, DUP. Um, absolutely. I mean, that's the last thing they will want to see, won't they? And, and, you know, clearly that's what they've been holding out because they don't want to see greater divisions. That was always what they saw as a betrayal, the dividing line between uh, down the Irish Sea that they saw Boris Johnson as having sold them out. And this whole process of negotiation, the Windsor framework, what we've seen, the government offering them what the EU clearly seems to be willing to give a bit of ground on this as well in terms of... Re it seems reducing the number of checks they're going to be insisting on is all about easing trade between uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, so that division isn't felt, but clearly that's not how Sinn Féin necessarily is. No, for now, thanks very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Still to come on The Breakfast Show for you. Calls for urgent government action to boost the UK's resilience to extreme weather events. I'll speak to a meteorologist about the best measures to take. Plus... Concerns have been raised about the treatment of North Korean defectors who fled to China. Sky News hears from a relative of a deportee. A lot of gas being fired all around us. It is an absolute carnival kind of atmosphere out here for Prime Minister Modi's decisive victory. These students are defying the prohibitory orders and now they're going to be arrested. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. The roads have been inundated. The only way out is to get people by boat. What is feared that over 200 people might have died because of these landslides. This on any given day would have been bustling with people, but today it's absolutely deserted. This is one of the most sensitive areas of, uh, of North East Delhi where there's been clashes. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Again, everybody, you're watching The Breakfast Show here on Sky News. Um, Captain Tom, we all remember Captain Tom, don't we? Yes. And the hundred lengths that he was doing mm -hmm. of his um, garden, raised £38 million for the NHS. Hasn't worked out that well since. No, it hasn't. From everything from the spa to the speaking engagements to the book profits as well. Talking and about his daughter. And with regards to his daughter, yes. And, and kind of funds and the charity being investigated by the Charities Commission and now the scaffolding going up around the spa because the planning application that went in and then the terms of it changed somewhat, didn't they? 
well, it wasn't originally meant to be a spa, was it? It was a very different kind of building, I think, that they applied for planning permission for. And then it turns out they built something quite different, a lot bigger, that contained this spa. They claimed that, oh, well, it should be um, allowed because they would allow rehabilitation sessions for elderly people within the local community, which I don't think really washed with the council and obviously that is the power that councils have to say well if you didn't have permission then we're going to go in and demolish it and ensure that you do and that's what they're doing but like you say for someone who was Captain Tom Moore himself was such a symbol of hope wasn't he throughout and, and kind of joy and national um, kind of coming together during Covid with all that money raised for the NHS but since then the legacy since he died in 2021 of the way his family have kind of continued that has just left a, a rather difficult taste in the mouth. I would say. Yeah they have to knock it down by the 7th of February. Mm after an appeal in November didn't go ahead. Uh, and I'm just reading that um, the pool will be uh, the last thing to be removed. Last thing to be removed. And it has to go on the 7th. And the council, they say they'll be there on the 8th to check the site in itself to yeah. make sure it definitely has gone. Never so. take on council planners. No. Top tip. <laughs> no, Never. <laughs> Never. Uh, pharmacies. Pharmacies, yes. Lots of news we've just heard from the Minister as well there, haven't we, earlier, Andrea Leadsom, saying that pharmacies will be able to treat seven common conditions. That's without patients needing to see a doctor. The scheme's expected to save around 10 million GP appointments every year. Post-Brexit checks on food, plant and animal imports from the EU come into force today. Meat and dairy, fruit and veg and even cut flowers will require specific health certificates. Nicola Sturgeon gives evidence at the Scottish COVID inquiry today in the toughest test of her stewardship of the pandemic so far. Expect to hear her asked about her WhatsApp messages from the time which were wiped from her phone before the inquiry. And we're looking at the extreme weather the UK is starting to face with more frequency, including the weather warnings in place for parts of the country today. Let's talk about that in more detail, should we? Jim Dale, meteorologist, is with us. Hi, Jim. It's good to good see morning. you. Thanks for taking the time, as always. Um, how dangerous can the rise in temperatures be? It's always difficult at this time of year when you walk out on a train it's station, for example, yeah. it's freezing cold and you can't think forward. Um, but we've been there before. A couple of years ago, 40.3 uh, was, the, was the top and everybody else, 37, 38. So, look, it's a silent killer. Um, that's what, what this is committee... Uh, simply because um, when these things are reported, it, they're not reported you died of, of um, you know, when people die of this, this, of heat. It's not reported you die of heat. It's reported you die of a stroke or a heart attack or other symptoms that go with hot weather. And hot weather does kill as much as cold weather kills. So weather is massively underestimated. And I'm really glad that this committee have got some... Whether they've got teeth is another matter, but at least they brought it to, your, to the attention. And also the fact that you are actually reporting it on Sky News because, it, again, it's, it's almost like a silent story. It doesn't get out there, it doesn't resonate until it starts happening. And we're very poor at that. As a nation, we're very poor at moving forward and sort of pre-planning. And that goes for all types of... So how do we pre-plan? Well, it, it starts with the government. So what uh, do you want them to do? How what do I want help? them to do? I, I want them... Well, if you've ever seen that film, Don't Look Up, Leonardo DiCaprio, um, the idea behind that is a comet coming to Earth and nobody pays attention, the government go off on a, uh, a pre-election, whatever, and, um, it, you know, and eventually the comet hits the Earth and, and everybody gets destroyed. Now, yeah, I'm not what do you going want the that fine. <laughs> well, number one, pay attention. Pay attention and start planning. So within that committee report, there are certain things that they're suggesting, for example, Passive greening. Passive what greening. What is passive greening? Yeah. Um, it means that we start to think about um, not not just plants, but that's part of it. Putting, making roofs a little bit more greener. So put, planting, planting plants, trees in in areas that perhaps you wouldn't see. So I go running in the woods, and I'll tell you the difference between running in the woods or walking in the woods. And walking by the side of, a, of the road called the London Road, which I I go past. No, no, past no. Tell me two. more about what. The, no, no. Tell, no, no. Not you specifically. Tell me what more the government can do apart from planting plants. I think it begins with education. I think they've got to put this into schools, colleges, and the broader spectrum of uh, society to make them understand, make people understand that that weather, per se, whether we're talking storms, we're talking cold, hot understand that when you see these extremes of temperature, these, these, these extremes of weather, that we, we have to act accordingly. So 
what we do, I, I could be here for a, for a day and a half, but the, the point is, is we've got to move in that direction so people are, have got the knowledge to help themselves first, help their families first. So a, a really easy one would be, for example, uh, painting roofs white. Why? Because it reflects the heat in the summertime. When you get that ex excessive heat and you, you touch a white surface, it's very different than touching a black surface. And, the, the, you know, these are very simple things, but simple things are the answer, the solution to many of the things that we talk about. It okay. doesn't necessarily cost a lot, but we've got to move in that direction. Jim, sadly, we're out of time. It's good to see That's you. That's OK. Thanks Andrew. very much You're indeed. Welcome. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, let's move on and tell you about a militant group that's among those suspected of an attack that killed three US soldiers in pausing operations to prevent embarrassment to the Iraqi government. The Iran-aligned group, Qatab Hezbollah, is one of several factions American officials believe may have carried out the drone attack on a US airbase in Jordan. Let's get more with John Malik, who's standing by in the Jordanian capital of Amman this morning. Hi, um, Dominic. Always great to see you. Tell us more about this story. Well, it's very interesting, Kay, because as you say, Qatar Hezbollah, which is one of these Iranian-backed militias that I, I would say is probably at the top of the list of suspects for this attack on Tower 22, which is an American military base on uh, the border of uh, Jordan and uh, Iraq and Syria, that killed uh, three American troops, but also injured more than 40. Qatar Hezbollah, um, now in the crosshairs of any American reprisals, has said that it's not going to attack any more American bases. It's going to now engage in what it calls passive defence. I don't think anyone's taking it face value what it's the reason it's giving for that which is it doesn't want to embarrass the Iraqi government it's no never worried about that before but I think um, there are various schools of thought either enormous intense diplomatic pressure on Tehran their Iranian patrons is is uh, bearing fruit and they've ordered the militia group to back off or this group is is also possibly trying to claim the moral high ground in the eventuality it is attacked I think it's has to be said on the, on the face of it it is de-escalation at a time when the region really is on uh, edge expecting a possible major escalation when America uh, responds to the attack on, on its base. And it has to be said also the American president yesterday seemed to be relenting a bit when he was asked, as he believed the Iranians were behind the attack, he said, well, I blame them in the sense that they arm this group, but he didn't say anything else, which is a softening of America's position. One of his advisers, one of his spokespeople, has said that America will judge this group by its deeds, not its words. So there may be a period now where they watch to see what this group does next. I think that the, the, the overwhelming consensus amongst analysts and observers is that the Americans are still going to carry out strikes, uh, possibly against this group and others, but it's an intriguing development nonetheless. OK. For now, thank you. Still to come on The Breakfast Show this Wednesday morning. What does the coming year hold for Ukraine's resistance against Russia's illegal invasion? We joined by The Wall Street Journal's chief foreign affairs correspondent. And... Will be joining us talking about why Elon Musk has taken umbrage with the state of Delaware over his pay package. A lot of gas being fired all around us. It is an absolute carnival kind of atmosphere out here for Prime Minister Modi's decisive victory. 
This is one of the most sensitive areas of, uh, of North East Delhi where there's been clashes. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Next month will mark two years since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Can you believe it? Two years since. Uh, Yaroslav Torimov, Tro Trovimov, I'm so sorry, and I did practice it, didn't I? I'm so sorry, forgive me, uh, has written a book called Our Enemies Will uh, Vanish, also the chief foreign affairs correspondent of the Wall Street Journal. Tell me about your book. Well, it's a book that really traces the first history, the decisive uh, history of the first year of the war. Because really, sort of the front lines that we see now were all set by November 2022. So the book starts in January, just before the full-scale Russian invasion. And then uh, I was in Ukraine all the time. So I traveled uh, to the front lines uh, from Donbass to Kharkiv to Kherson, and really told the story of this war through the Ukrainians who came to, out to fight and who really surprised the world. Uh, after all, everybody had expected Ukraine to collapse in a matter of days, and yet it's still there fighting two years later. How much of a surprise was it uh, when Russia did invade? Because my understanding is that even the night before, people just didn't think it was going to happen. People didn't think it would happen this way because uh, this invasion made no sense if you assume the Ukrainians would fight back. And in fact, President Putin probably thought, he believed his own, his own Kool-Aid that the Ukrainians and the Russians are one people and the Ukrainians would just surrender. Uh, and switch sides. And in fact, the army he had assembled uh, for the invasion was far too small for the tasks that it faced. And we saw it because they were routed around Kiev by the end of the first month of the war. Mm. Ukraine has suffered some significant body blows since sure. February of 2022. You've been there to document them. Yes, well, you know, Ukraine has had a tremendous uh, uh, casualty toll from this war. You know, tens of thousands of civilians, tens of thousands of troops, and uh, in fact, it's some of the uh, most uh, talented and prominent Ukrainians who went to fight. You know, there were so many volunteers, opera singers, uh, sports people, uh, poets, there was a famous poet who was killed recently. And uh, I'm quoting one of the, uh, of the fighters in the book uh, during the Battle of Bakhmut, where Russia had sent tens of thousands of murderers and rapists recruited from prisons to fight. And he's saying, you know, we are losing our best and, the, and Russia is losing their worst. And that's not a fair trade. And that's really been the case through this war, unfortunately. Tell me about Kharkiv. What happened there? Well, Kharkiv uh, is a city that the Russians thought would fall immediately because it's a city that is uh, mostly Russian speaking, a city that had sympathies for Russia before the war and back in 2013, 2014. But having seen what actually happens under Russian rule in Donbass, where Russia had occupied uh, the cities of Donetsk and Lugansk for eight years, people of Kharkiv didn't really want that. They saw that it's, uh, you know, the economy there had collapsed, gangsters basically ruled the, uh, ruled the land, and s most of the population of the Russian ruled Donbass had fled to, rest, to the rest of Ukraine, to Europe, or to Russia. And so uh, Kharkiv turned out against the Russians in the very beginning. There were nobody switched sides. The population rose up just like in Kiev. And the city was pummeled mercilessly by the Russians. You know, hundreds and hundreds of high-rises were destroyed. And I was talking uh, to the mayor of Kharkiv in the subway, because that's the only way, uh, safe place at the time, and he was telling me that 
Putin thought that the Russian speakers of Ukraine would be his friends, but in fact, they are now the most hostile part of Ukrainians because it's their cities in the east and the south that were flattened. It's their relatives that have been destroyed. Whereas in Western Ukraine, fortunately, uh, for the people there, war is mostly something on television. This time last year, um, I went, um, I spent an hour in the presidential palace uh, with Zelensky. Mm -hmm. um, he was a very popular man at that time. Um, he heard um, during the time we were there that uh, Leopard 2 tanks were going to be mm -hmm. given to him. Europe was standing four square with him. It feels like the situation is very different now. Well, the situation is different because, first of all, uh, in America, you know, the US Congress is stuck. The, uh, indispensable military aid to Ukraine has not been passed because of Republican objections and because this whole issue has been tied up in American domestic politics mm -hmm. with issues such as border security, which is the most intractable issue in American politics. And that means that Ukraine is outgunned again in the battlefield. If, if there was parity in ammunition several months ago, now Russia has five to ten times more shells that can fire at Ukrainians. And uh, that has an effect on casualties, that has an effect on morale inside the society. And uh, you know, it's been two years. The strain on the economy, the strain on the people is obviously enormous. It's a miracle that until now the Ukraine sort of held up to the crack and the political tensions that are existing as in every society haven't yet spilled into, into an open conflict. Um, just a, a quick thought before I let you go. Um, it looks as though Zelensky's squaring up to his army chief. What's going to happen? Well, you know, <clears throat> that's one of the tensions that's been around for a while. And obviously, uh, it's part of it is the nature of the beast, because if you are the military commander, you look at the military considerations. If you're a political leader, you also have to look at diplomacy, you have to look at the economy, and sometimes your decisions are, you know, are not motivated by the same things. Yeah. But... Uh, so far, they've kept us uh, civilized. You know, so far, uh, you know, Zaluzhny remains head of the armed forces, and you know, nobody knows how long they will last. But mm. this is the case right now. It's great to see you. our enemies will vanish. Uh, your new book out, also, Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent of the Wall Street Journal. Great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. for taking the time. Bear with Thank me one second, if you would, please. Thanks. Wilf is joining us. Uh, Wilf. Um, the $56 billion question, is Elon Musk worth it? Well, exactly. We're going to talk about that. Uh, Elon Musk again today, because as you rightly point out, people are uh, saying he's going to have about $56 billion of his worth taken away from him. So just to sum up the numbers, he's worth about $210 billion. OK, $130 billion of that comes from his stake in Tesla. And this court in Delaware is potentially pulling back uh, about $55 billion worth of that stake. It all relates to a pay award he got back in 2018, early 2018. I remember covering it at the time. It was slightly absurd the way it was given to him. The odd thing about all of it is that since then, the performance of his company, of Tesla, has been even more absurd to the upside, uh, that if they'd gone through the process a bit more formally, a bit more carefully back in 2018, there'd probably be no questions about it. But uh, one shareholders filed this lawsuit actually back in the middle of 2018, and it's led to this decision uh, today uh, in Delaware uh, to say they want to reclaim 56 billion of, of, uh, of his value of Tesla shares. OK. Um, see you in the next hour, Will. Thanks very much indeed. Amanda's got the papers for us. Hi. Morning. Where Good do you want to start? Well, I think we're going to start with the Financial Times and this really quite extraordinary broadside from the IMS against the UK government, uh, warning the Chancellor and the Prime Minister against any more tax cuts, as they've been repeatedly hinting and suggesting that they're going to offer people in the March budget, obviously paving the way to the election later in the year. But they're saying, we don't have enough money. You haven't set out the kind of cuts you're going to have to need already. Looking at some of the others, looking at the Times, little room for big tax cuts. Mm. We've just been talking Absolutely. about that. Moving on to some of the other headlines, the I. Cameron didn't clear two-state solution speech with number 10. What's he up to? Oh, this is really interesting, isn't it? So this is comments that uh, the Foreign Secretary made in a speech to um, Arab leaders at a reception on Monday night in which he said that basically the government is looking at how they could pave the way to recognising Palestine as um, an independent state at the UN as part of the path to a two-state solution. Um, now, his team are arguing, well, that's, that's just what he was saying over the weekend when he was saying, you know, obviously they're working towards a two-state solution, but it's not official 
officially government policy. Looks like he's freelancing a little bit, which is interesting given his previous role. <laughs> Good job that didn't come out at number 10 on Monday. If you know, you know. <laughs> Looking at The Guardian, for you, state of NHS should be declared a national emergency. These are two very happy ladies. Fascinating story behind it. I want to mm. see how that develops. So and looking at it. the Daily Telegraph, Navy ready to send a carrier to the Red Sea. Well, that's interesting, isn't that's it? It's called escalation. It is indeed. I mean, obviously, we've been talking about sort of naval strength of the UK, and now it looks like this is a bit of a, a line to kind of show that we do still have capability. We do have an aircraft carrier possibility when the US has to send theirs home, the USS Eisenhower, I think, that where, could the UK actually uh, send ours instead to support the operations against the Houthis? Was really quickly through the others looking at the Express. Uh, migration rules will halt shock. Population rise, so says uh, James Cleverly, the mm. Daily Mail. Uh, Bashir, I was a victim of racism inside the BBC. And the Mirror reports uh, from Spain was the moany. <laughs> and this young man, <laughs> oh dear, this story. On a bender in, in Northern North Ireland. Two day bender mm. in Northern Ireland. What's <laughs> going on, young mm. man? Quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Wet and windy conditions will sweep into Scotland overnight with rain spreading south through the day. Yellow wind warnings are in place for the northern half of the country with storm force winds expected in the far north, gusts in excess of 50 miles an hour for northern England. The bulk of the country will be dry overnight. The Weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. We all crept in while I was doing the weather. Some of us <laughs> quieter than others. Shimon? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the Oh dear. Tell me pharmacies. Well, around 9 out of 10 community pharmacies will now be offering a service, which means people can go straight to a pharmacy uh, for common issues such as sore throat and earaches without having to go to the GP. It's hoping that around 10 million GP appointments could be freed up each year if successful. Yeah, and, and they're going to deal with, amongst other things, insect bites. I get some nasty insect Ooh, yeah, bites. Oh, yeah, same. They, they just kind of end up massive. You don't really need to go to the GP, do you? No. But it, I did see horse one... Horseflies. Horseflies, oh. which are always attracted yeah, right. to blue. So if you don't wear blue, they won't come and bite you oh. so much. So they, horseflies, in particular, see the colour blue and are attracted to it. Cover up a blue T-shirt, you'll be less bothered. Oh, right. Well, we're all right. You yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're in a lot of trouble. What about you? Yeah, I mean, interesting, isn't it? I mean, Rishi Sunak's one thing. Especially as a pregnant lady. Well, yes, exactly. Well, it's useful. And to be fair, I've got a lot of help from pharmacies throughout my pregnancy. It's been really, really helpful. So they're definitely there, a resource to be used, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, but are they getting enough money from the government mm. in order to be able to carry out their extra duties? A question that we'll be asking in the next hour here on Sky News. All today's top stories coming up. See you then.
Good morning, everybody. It's 8 o'clock. Coming up on today's programme, Brexit is back. We're talking all about that, Amanda. Indeed. Plus, looking ahead to the legislation on that DUP deal for Northern Ireland. Yeah. Plus, the bulldozers bear down on the soon-to-be-demolished spa at the home of Captain Tom's daughter. Yeah. It's Wednesday, the 31st of January. The government pours cold water on the Sinn Féin's suggestion of a future united Ireland after a breakthrough on power sharing in Stormont. Telling this programme... Yeah, Call your jets, Mary Lou Macdonald, because it's not happening, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. in, my, in my world, I would go a very long way to make sure that didn't happen yet, that Northern Ireland is an integral part, a much-loved part of the United Kingdom. Brexit red tape. Could new customs controls coming in today force up the price of food for British consumers? The pharmacist will see you now. We'll tell you what ailments you can now get treatment for without seeing a GP. Big day at the COVID inquiry as Nicola Sturgeon prepares to give evidence where they're live. Extreme weather warning after the storms. Now the sun in the spotlight as MPs say 10,000 people could die as a result of heat waves. I like to be in America. OK, by me in America. Everything free in America. For a small fee in America. Nothing free. Tributes to the Broadway icon Chita Rivera, whose career spanned seven decades. She's died at the age of 91. Morning, everybody. Uh, two political hot potatoes for you this morning. Brexit and that DUP deal about power sharing in Northern Ireland. More on Brexit shortly. And an interesting thought from the government on whether flower sellers should still import from Europe first. The government's poured cold water on Sinn Féin's suggestion of a future United Ireland after a breakthrough on power sharing in Stormont. I absolutely will do everything possible to ensure that Northern Ireland remains part of the UK internal market, that we respect totally the challenges in Northern Ireland. And I think that what the government has done in providing a package of support to Northern Ireland that has enabled um, the DUP party leaders to come together and decide to reform the Stormont Assembly is brilliant news. OK, and, so yeah, call cool your jets, Mary Lou Macdonald, because it's not happening, is that what you're saying? Uh, in, my, in my world, I would go a very long way to make sure that didn't happen yet, that Northern Ireland is an integral part, a much-loved part of the United Kingdom. Potential fallout from that? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I think particularly the use of the word yet there, that she'd do everything in her power to stop that happening yet. I mean, of course, Sinn Féin, that's their uh, raison d'etre, really, is, is, is trying to um, um, get a united Ireland across the island of Ireland. But this tends to um, simmer below the surface. But it's, it doesn't... It, absolutely. It's not really something that government ministers normally even acknowledge as a, as, as a remote possibility. Last night, we had Mary Lou McDonald saying um, the days of partition... Hey, Sinn Féin. Um, yes, exactly, saying the, day, uh, the days of partition are numbered um, as a result of the fact that we've got this deal, um, which, of course, is all about reassuring the DUP that um, they are an integral part of the you know, of, uh, United Kingdom and trying to remove any barriers with trade with the rest of Great Britain, getting rid of that green lane, those custom checks, that customs paperwork on goods coming from the rest of um, Great Britain into Northern Ireland. Um, but then, of course, their greater fear is that actually this is something that becomes more likely as a result of this because of course with the restoration of power sharing we would see um, a Sinn Féin first minister in in Northern Ireland for the first time Michelle O'Neill and obviously that, that that does then open that conversation and then potentially Mary M Lou Macdonald also in charge in um, Ireland so it's, it's a looking a very different future, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely, the yeah. politics I mean, there. Yeah, whisper quietly, that's not what the DUP wants to hear. No, indeed, and nor the, nor the discussion the UK government wants to happen today as they prepare to set out the detail of what their legislation will be in Parliament later on. Fascinating it's stuff. Very interesting. Politics mm. is so interesting. <laughs> now, we also asked the Minister about post-Brexit checks on food, plant and animal imports from the EU that come into force today. The cost to British businesses could be hundreds of millions of pounds annually annually pushing up prices. We asked whether the government thinks flower sellers, for example, should continue to import to the UK from Europe despite the cost. Our business correspondent Paul Kelso reports. 
At New Covent Garden Market, they're gearing up for Valentine's Day. But the course of true love and free trade may not run smooth this year. From today, for the first time, imported cut flowers face Brexit border checks. Valentine's Day is crazy. It is one of the biggest, biggest days of the floristry calendar, and it's worldwide. So um, flowers are shipped through Holland everywhere. Um, so, I mean, our borders are now causing us an issue with that. To pass British Customs, imported flowers now need a health certificate signed off by a European plant inspector. These new rules mean that some of the most popular flowers, orchids, chrysanthemums imported from Europe, will need paperwork and, in time, checks at the border. The rules have already been delayed five times in the last three years. But for this trade, eight years after the vote, Brexit isn't done. It's only just beginning. It's not just flowers, food imports including cheese, dairy and eggs and chilled and frozen meat and fish for which the UK relies heavily on EU imports are also affected. The government says the checks will prevent pests and diseases like swine flu but admits this new red tape will cost businesses £330 million a year and increase food inflation. I know this is absolute anathema to the current government that we should sit down with the European Union negotiate a comprehensive veterinary agreement based on alignment. Uh, that would wipe away this problem overnight, remove all the costs. It would also significantly resolve the issues uh, in relation to goods moving to Northern Ireland. Officials say they'll be pragmatic and do not expect disruption. But the reality of Brexit is trade barriers at the border. Paul's here. We're going to chat about that in more detail in just a second. This is what Andrea Ledsom said uh, on whether small businesses should stop buying from Europe and turn to the UK instead. So, I mean, I've had many constituency cases over the years of people who've changed their trading arrangements with the European Union as a result of different frictions, whether it's postal cost changing, whether it's um, border so controls and Europe, so on. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that businesses need to adapt to meet the changing environment. There are huge opportunities so from the rest do? of the world. Well, I don't know her particular circumstances. She can't afford the flowers that, and the extra increase that it's going to cost her to get the checks before she brings them over from the Netherlands. So there are many parts of the United Kingdom that are flower growers themselves, and there are other parts of so the world that So she shouldn't buy from Europe, that's well, what you're saying. I'm not saying that at all. I'm well, you saying, are. I don't know her exactly circumstances. What you're and obviously, what some businesses will do is continue to trade with the EU and absorb those costs. What she was saying, right? It's what it sounded like, <laughs> wasn't it? I mean, it's, there's a, it was interesting to Andrea Leadsom on today, that the day that Brexit finally really arrives for EU imports into the UK. She was business secretary in 2019, a key figure in that election campaign. And what we heard from her was some of the old vote leave campaign points. She said there are Never mind dealing with Europe, there are great opportunities. We've signed trade deals with 70 countries around the world. Many of them are rolled over. What that doesn't really help with is the fact that uh, when it comes to flowers, first of all, uh, it's not flower growing season at the moment. Buying UK doesn't help you with Valentine's Day and Mother's Day or Easter. About 90% of the flowers that aren't grown in the UK come via the Netherlands anyway. So Europe is a key market. 50% of our pork, 60% of fresh produce, that's fruit and veg, all come from Europe, so there might be opportunities elsewhere. But these controls at the border with Europe really matter because it remains our biggest trading partner. And this is going to push up prices, even by the government's own costs. It's going to add to food inflation and costs. So there's a real cost of business. And for a lot of this, there isn't an option. OK, uh, let's see what happens uh, in the coming days and weeks. For now, Paul, thanks very much indeed. Meantime, pharmacies. Yes, we're going to be talking about the pharmacies and the announcement from the government this morning that... Seven common conditions can now be treated by a pharmacist rather than by a GP. Pharmacies will be able to treat conditions including sinitis, sore throats, earaches, infected insect bites, impetigo, shingles and uncomplicated urinary tract infections in women under the age of 65. Nicola Sturgeon gives evidence at the COVID inquiry in Edinburgh today in the toughest test of her stewardship of the pandemic yet. It looks at decision making between early January and late March 2020 when the first national lockdown was imposed. Connor Gillies is in Scotland for us. And Connor, what are we expecting to hear from the First Minister? 
Well, Nicola Sturgeon arrived here in the last few moments and anticipation is palpable ahead of what will be her biggest interrogation yet on those forensic examinations of her decisions during the height of the crisis here in Scotland. This has become an inquiry that has become engulfed in a scandal over deleted WhatsApps. We know the former First Minister has wiped all of her pandemic-related exchanges. That has created fury by those who lost loved ones during COVID. They are arriving here in the next few minutes. They are expecting answers uh, and they will be hoping that those questions will be asked very swiftly. Uh, but Nicola Sturgeon has been keen to say she did not routinely uh, conduct government business via WhatsApp. But that stands in stark contrast to what she said in a live television briefing in 2021, where she said she would give an assurance uh, that nothing would be off limits to this inquiry. There will also be questions here in Edinburgh today about her style of government, accusations that she ran a presidential style of first minister uh, and that very many decisions were made around a small, tight-knit group of people, a small, close-knit people within power in the Scottish Government. How did that go down? Did that have an impact on the pandemic? Those questions will be asked here in the coming hours. Connor, thank you so much. A militant group that's among those suspected of an attack that killed three US soldiers says it's pausing operations to prevent, I quote, the embarrassment to the Iraqi government. The Iran-aligned group Qatayb Hezbollah is one of several factions that American officials believe may have carried out the drone attack on a US airbase in Jordan. President Joe Biden's confirmed he's made up his mind about how to respond, but hasn't outlined what that will involve. Elon Musk is threatening to move the tax base of his company Tesla. That's after a judge in Delaware blocked the board from giving him a $56 billion pay packet. He's polled his followers, asking whether to move where the company is incorporated from Delaware to Texas, where the company's headquarters is. So far, the vast majority agree he should. Emails released by the BBC show how Martin Bashir told colleagues professional jealousy was to blame for allegations that he secured an interview with Princess Diana through deceit. The journalist wrote the message in 2020, months before a BBC Panorama interview exposed the scandal surrounding his infamous 1995 interview, in which he said of her relationship with the then Prince Charles, there were three of us in this marriage. A damning report found that Bashir had faked bank statements and showed them to Earl Spencer, Diana's brother, in order to gain access to the princess. And there's a warning that thousands of people could die if more isn't done to tackle heat waves. 2023 was the hottest year on record. Iva Bennett looks at whether we're ready for what's being dubbed the silent killer. The fear is we're under attack and the weapon is the weather. Extreme heat no longer a freak event, but seen as a fixture of our summits, which MPs say will prove a silent killer if the UK doesn't act. It's here, it's a present danger, and it's coming at us quite quickly. And so we looked again at how resilient is the UK to the impact of higher temperatures. And we found that there is really a lot of work that needs to be done. Up to 10,000 people a year could die if nothing is done, according to the Environmental Audit Committee, with the elderly and vulnerable most at risk. And they say the threat is to both physical health and mental. It's normally this kind of weather and the gloomy winter that's associated with causing low mood and depression. But MPs are warning heat can have the same effect too, with potentially deadly consequences. According to their report, when the temperature goes from 22 degrees to 32 degrees, the suicide risk in the UK doubles. So what can be done? One suggestion is to name heat waves, like we do storms, to increase public awareness of the dangers. It's clear that Britain still thinks of itself as a cold country that celebrates periods of heat by talking about going to the beach and eating ice cream, when in actual fact it's an extreme weather event that leads to thousands of deaths. We have to alter our perception. There are also calls to retrofit homes and offices to make them cooler. An overheated workforce costs the economy an estimated £60 billion a year. But the biggest fear is the cost to life. Ivor Bennett, Sky News.
Sandy's here to talk to us about a very special um, Sky News investigation into crypto casino accounts. Tell me more. Yes. So I found there are hundreds of accounts for sale for as little as £8 where you can buy an account for an online casino that accepts cryptocurrencies. So that's like Bitcoin. Those kind of casinos are called crypto casinos and they're actually illegal in the UK but are rising in popularity because of rappers like Drake and other celebrities promoting them. I wish that it was something I wasn't anticipating, but knowing what I do know about that kind of environment, I think it was only a matter of time before we saw these things happening. There seems to be a mindset throughout the gambling industry that because it's gone for so long unchecked, that there is no reason to have any consideration about what is right and what is wrong. You know, There's no moral compass there. We've seen it in mainstream gambling and now we've seen it in crypto. So that um, is the lady who's in charge just across the road, actually, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. It's All Karen... Party Parliamentary Group. Yeah, it's Carolyn Harris. She's the chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group into gambling related harms. She and other campaigners are really worried about this and say that, as well as the gambling industry, as she just said, needs more scrutiny, also the social media companies and to make sure that these accounts aren't as easy to access. When I was researching this, it's really scary just how harmful these sites can be with people losing their life savings in an hour, hour and a half. Goodness me. Actually, I know that you approached TikTok, didn't you? Reddit, Discord, what's Discord? It's a messaging app that's really popular with people that play video games. OK, and Meta, we all know who that is. All removed the accounts after being contacted by Sky News. Great work. <laughs> the social media companies said the safety of users is the top priority and that their community guidelines do not allow the promotion of gambling services or activities after being approached by Sky News. Stake.com said it's aware of attempts, have we got these guys, to evade our industry leading controls by a variety of means. The spokesperson added that Stake has the strongest controls in the industry and they work with regulators and law enforcement to stop fraudulent attempts to get onto their site. Stake.com is not available in the UK and we invest in detecting and preventing problem Gambling always easier when people can read it on the screen <laughs> yeah. rather than me just spouting what they're saying at them. But, I mean, that's amazing work that you have done and it really helps people that either are addicted to gambling or somebody in their family perhaps might be. Absolutely. And a lot of these sites, campaigners worry, are targeting children and exactly people like that, people with existing disordered gambling habits. OK. Good to see you. Thanks very much indeed. Quick look at the weather for you. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, wet and windy conditions will sweep into Scotland overnight with rain spreading south through the day. Yellow wind warnings are in place for the northern half of the country with storm force winds expected in the far north and gusts in excess of 50 miles an hour for northern England. The bulk of the country will be dry overnight with a frost in areas where skies clear for any length of time. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Philip Sadiq's here for Labour this morning. Uh, lots to talk about. Can I just pick up, though, before we go anywhere else, uh, with what I was hearing from the government in the last hour? Um, uh, Andrea Leadsom saying, basically, over her dead body, would there be a united island? Whereas we saw two of the two most important ladies at Sinn Féin on many of the front pages saying, actually, that we can see that in the distant horizon. What's Labour's view? Well, we heard, you know, the news coming through that their GDP was happy to go. And we are happy with this news, that they're reaching some sort of negotiation. The people of Northern Ireland have been without a proper government for two years I'm now. I'm asking about Sinn Féin, yeah. specifically. I, mean, I think, I think that, I mean, our, what we want to see is some sort of peace reached and some sort of, there'll be challenges and options along the way. And we will support um, whatever brings peace to So people. would Labour support a united island if that was what uh, the people of Northern Ireland wanted? I think we have to see how the negotiations go on and see details of what comes forward. Um, I'm not sure we could use strong language like over my dead body because I think we have to see... She didn't what say people that. Were. Oh, she didn't I'm say that. Okay, that. I'm just paraphrasing that. Okay. Actually, I, I said cool your jets as far as Mary Lee MacDonald is concerned. But what I'm trying to drill down on is would, in principle, 
the Labour Party, if they were the government of the day, be in any way supportive of a united Ireland? I think we want to stay as it is at the moment, and it's a very important place for us. Um, it's part of the UK market, and that's what we're happy with. OK, so Sinn Féin, uh, that would, it would not be a united Ireland. On, they would not have no support, as far as Labour was concerned, if you were the government of the day. Is that what you're saying? Well, probably not. No. OK. Talk to me, um, if you would, please, about pharmacies. West Streeting has spoken about how the NHS needs reform. The government launching the first NHS Pharmacy First service, which they say will save uh, 10 million GP appointments. Is that something that Labour welcomes? What I would welcome is a proper funding of the NHS. I'm very worried about the reports that have come forward. And, you know, you won't be surprised when you see what the reports are saying, that the NHS is on its knees, that it's not fit for purpose. We've got to completely reset and look at what's happening. I'm very worried that we're in a position where the NHS, which I think is probably the most precious thing in our country, that's why I joined the Labour Party, we're in a situation where people can't be seen We've talked a lot about how we're going to introduce two million more GP appointments. So I think what we need to do is take a different approach to the NHS. But this is would free funding up 10 is million important. appointments. This would free up 10 million if, appointments. If it works, then that's something obviously we would support. But I want to see how it works in practice. I also want to look at taking a more preventative approach to the NHS. I'm a bit worried that we have views where we bring in something, it sorts the current problem, but what are they actually going to do about the fact that we have to change the approach of the NHS? So one of the things the Labour Party's talked about is bringing in more scanners, extra scanners, to diagnose people early so that I'm it's preventative. about pharmacists particularly, yeah, and I, we know how but, it's going to work because you're going to go to the, to the pharmacy instead of to the GP. It's that simple. But if it depends on if the pharmacist is actually trained to give that advice as well, right? So we've talked about extra training. I don't know if the government's talked about extra training, but we want to give NHS staff extra training. If they're going to provide the training, that's a different story. But you have to... 90% of the, pharmacists have signed up. They think it's great. I do. I mean, if, if my pharmacy, local pharmacy is great, but I have gone in there sometimes and asked about something and they said, absolutely, I'm sorry, I can't help you because you have to go to the GP. I'm not qualified to give this advice. So I de it depends on what you want to use the pharmacy for. But in my opinion, they have to take a more holistic approach to the NHS and I don't feel the government's done that. OK, talk to me about Labour's plans to boost financial services. What, what does that look like? So one of the things I've done, and because I'm Shadow City Minister, I talk to people, the sta stakeholders in the city quite a lot, and they're saying that the financial services sector is a huge asset in our country. We're not utilising it enough to drive growth in the economy. And that's what we want to do. We want to utilise the financial services to do things like tackle regional inequality, to create more jobs, to drive growth in the economy. So I'm undertaking this review with some panel experts from, from the city who have expertise in this field to find out what can we do to support the financial services more, which the government currently isn't doing. For example, the, um, the FCA has a 10,000-page handbook, which is full of bureaucracy and outdated rules. We want to work, if we're in government, with the FCA to look at these rules and see, are there some that are outdated? Can we get rid of some? Can we make sure that we, it's up to speed with what the current economic climate needs? Because firms are complaining, it takes too long. We can't innovate, we can't expand, we can't invest in our country. And these are the things that we want to look at to drive growth. And you know we desperately need growth in the economy right now. To that end, given the new rules that are coming into place today, which are massively going to impact on British business, £350 million a year or thereabouts, with all the extra checks and red tape that's going to be in place, would Labour look again at some of those measures that the government's bringing into force today? What we've said is we would look at it to see, you know, if they work or not. We would take a view on whether they're working, whether businesses welcome them, and then make a decision off the back of that. So but you what might I would, them. well, this is, I mean, this is one of the worries that people had when I was undertaking this financial services review, which is coming out, is that would we come in and rip up all existing legislation and rules because we're a new government coming in? And I want to reassure people in the city because they brought this concern up a few times. The truth is, if we come in 
and the legislation is working, these policies are good for business, of course we won't be ripping up legislation if it's actively working for our economy. And if there are saying? things, yeah, if there are things that aren't working, then of course we need to review it and look at it. Like, for example, when I'm speaking to people, they're saying, I mean, this is getting very technical, but reforms to solvency two are too slow. So should we be speeding yeah, I'm talking more up? generally about what's happening today I, as but, far as Brexit border controls are yeah. concerned. And I have a lady coming onto the programme uh, in the next hour. She's a flower seller. She gets all of her flowers from the Netherlands, that they are going to go increase in price because of the extra checks that need to be done to such an extent that she may not be able to do that anymore. Andrew Leadsom said, buy your flowers from the UK instead. Would a Labour government look again at trying to help her? Yes, absolutely. And I think Andrew Leadsom's response is completely wrong. I mean, if we can help people, the people who have had so far negotiated with Brexit has been Liz Truss and Boris Johnson. I am absolutely convinced, Gay, that a Labour politician will do a better job than them at getting what's right for our country. So you'd want to change the Brexit rules? We would look at, look at where businesses are struggling, where the economy is struggling, and go and see if we can get a better deal for our country. That's what anyone who's in charge should be doing. Wouldn't that they be should opposite be looking... to what the British, government, the British people voted for in 2016? They may have voted to leave the European Union, but they didn't vote to get a bad deal. Well, they're still our closest trading partners. If we can work to get some sort of negotiation, which is good for our country, I don't think any British person is going to say no to our economy improving or our trade deals getting better. OK. Let me just ask you before I let you go. I know you're a very uh, busy lady, Mr Deep, but um, I see that Andrew Bridgen, according to one of my papers, this morning, um, wants to bring uh, a far-right, that's how she's been described, politician, to speak at the House of Commons or within the uh, estate of uh, the Palace of Westminster to talk about the, the damage that vaccines can cause. Is that something that should be allowed? I haven't seen that piece of news, mm -hmm. but who is, I mean, who is the far-right person? She is a German far-right politician. Who doesn't believe in vaccine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell you, I am unashamedly a champion of vaccines. I stood in front of the Royal Free Hospital during COVID and encouraged people to take the COVID vaccine. So for me, this would be unacceptable. OK, it's good to see you. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, still to come on The Breakfast Show, we're going to be speaking to Amanda in more detail about what we've, what we've heard uh, from Labour and also talking about mobile phones or teenagers. Do they cause too much online harm? Plus, police commentator Graham Wetton is with me to look at crime stats. And scaffolding goes up at the spa pool block of Captain Tom's daughter in preparation for demolition. trusted place for news. 
the roads have been inundated. The only way out is to get people by boat. What is feared that over 200 people might have died because of these landslides. This on any given day would have been bustling with people, but today it's absolutely deserted. This is one of the most sensitive areas of, uh, of Northeast Delhi where there's been clashes. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. You're watching The Breakfast Show here on Sky News. A story that's caught our eye in the morning papers is about Captain Tom Moore. We all love Captain Tom Moore, didn't we? Bless his cotton socks, he walked 100 lengths of his garden during lockdown to raise, he hoped, £100 for the NHS. Eventually, he raised £38 million. However, since he died, he's there with his daughter, Hannah Ingram Moore. Things have gone downhill somewhat. Yes, they have somewhat, haven't they? There's been this issue that we're focusing on at the moment regarding this spa that was built in the, the grounds of the family home. It was initially built on the planning application with the Captain Tom Foundation's name attributed to it. And then later on in the process, in the building process, that was then changed and it was said that the kind of spa pool, the kitchen and the toilet would be used for private use. And the council's gone, well, that's not what we agreed to. After bit of back and forth and some, some appeals against that, it's got to come down. So the bulldozer's moving in, well, beginning of the week, maybe. Exactly that. £200,000 is how much it cost. Uh, uh, what I've learned uh, over the years dealing with councils is never, ever, ever take on the planners. No, I mean, they know their rights, don't they? Yeah. I mean, you remember that mansion that was built and hidden behind all those hay bales, I absolutely remember, huge, yeah. that ended up, you know, how could you possibly demolish this amazing home? Well, you didn't have buying permission. I mean, that's, you know, it's meant to be a level playing field for everyone. But um, in this case, it just seems really sad, doesn't it, that some someone who was such a kind of a name that inspired such kind a of... National treasure. Yeah, absolutely, and he was knighted by the Queen um, and, you know, gave everyone hope, you know, during the misery of lockdown and COVID, and then now... Yes. Um, absolutely. I mean, just look at him. And then now, obviously, all these stories that have come out, the investigations that's going on, the, the, the book sales that ended up um, not going to the foundation but just to the family's own company, it's just a bit of a bit of a nasty taste in the mouth, isn't it? And it is worth pointing out that the, the family say they've received death threats because of some of the things that have gone on. They have, you know, like you say, it's, it's left a nasty taste in the mouth, but they, some people have been particularly vicious mm, towards them. Yeah. I don't think there's a lot of sympathy for them, mm. if I'm honest. No, no, but so there let's is wait also and a see. limit. Let's yeah. wait and see what happens. They have to demolish it before the 7th of February. Yes, and then the council comes to check on the 8th to make sure it's definitely gone. But I'm sure, I'm sure, the, press would, I'm sure the press would tell them that beforehand. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Let's remind you, shall we, of the top stories this morning. A government minister has discounted the idea of a united island after it was suggested by Sinn Féin's Mary Lou Macdonald yesterday. The party's president made the comments following a breakthrough instalment on power sharing. Post-Brexit checks on food, plant and animal imports from the European Union come into force today. Meat and dairy, fruit and veg, even cut flowers will all require specific health certificates. Pharmacies will be able to treat seven common conditions without patients needing to see a doctor. The scheme is expected to free up around 10 million NHS GP appointments every year. Nicola Sturgeon gives evidence at the Scottish COVID inquiry today in the toughest test of her stewardship of the pandemic so far. Expected to be asked about are her WhatsApp messages from the time, which were wiped from her phone before the inquiry. Here's a question for you. Should phones be banned for under-16s? That's what one group of parents are calling for, saying phones should come with a tobacco-style health warning on packaging because addictive apps can leave children distracted, isolated and depressed. 
Campaigners, us for them, are calling on the government to intervene to protect children. Pleased to say representative is with us this morning, Molly Kingsley, along with Noah Kagali, a Conservative councillor, political commentator with Young Voices UK. Great to see you both. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. What's your beef with mobile phones? Um, she said it's not mobile phones per se, um, but it's with smartphones and in particular the very addictive by design technology that they put in the hands of kids 24 7. And the stats on these speak for themselves. You know, 91% of our 11 year olds have a smartphone and they lose, on average, three hours, 20 minutes of their day to that phone. And, you know, we are seeing the impacts of this everywhere we look across an entire cohort of children. So our issue is, by all means, give your child a phone. You know, if we can have a GPRS phone, text functionality, a phone that they can call people on, fantastic. But really, the kind of smartphone addictive technology is not suitable for children. So a brick, a burner phone they can have, but not these flash phones. Look, at the end of the day, we live in a digitised world and it is, quite frankly, ridiculous to expect under-16s to not exist within that world, create something that doesn't exist for them till the day they turn, what, say, 17, maybe 16, where they can now fully integrate in our into our digital society. It's, it's heavy-handed and, to be honest, it's lazy when we could be teaching our young people how to responsibly use possibly the most powerful invention that humanity has ever, has ever happened across. That we have such wealth of information in our pockets all the time. We need to teach our young people how to use that in the best way possible, rather than just this heavy-handed ban. So, look, I mean, that makes sense when you say it, but actually the reality is it is failing for children and parents. So, you know, you have an issue here that has become a cohort-wide problem. All children have phones, most parents have phones. The truth is parents aren't using their phones responsibly. Like, we are failing our children and, you know, monkey see, monkey do. So we are setting this terrible example and our children, just like us, are becoming addictive to this technology. So, you, you know, the state, there is a point at which a state intervenes to protect society, protect adults, protect children, when we're failing to protect our children from harm and we have reached that point. And, and the state should intervene and ensure that we integrate the technology into the way young people learn and we teach them to use it responsibly. It's not, it's not, shouldn't be a government's role to just embark on some regressive policy because they don't, and parents sometimes don't know how to deal with a technology. We should be ambitious and look forward and work out how to make something that is, at the end of the day, an amazing tool, something that young people and adults use responsibly. So, look, I mean, I, I think we can accept that there is a situation where it's phones true, are made safe. Sure, and, you know, there's quite. legislation which may help. Personally, I think it will barely scratch the surface of the harm that phones unleash on kids. And I think until you have technology that is proven safe in a child's hand, that technology should not be made available to children. It's exploitative. You know, the phone companies, the social media companies are monetizing our children's eyeballs, their attention, their time, their lives, and they are monetizing that for the benefit of advertisers. Children get none of that reward. It is all harm for children. I mean, it's not. I, I think I've seen people suggest that it is similar to something like crack cocaine, I think is the word that's used a lot in the media. That's complete nonsense. Something like that, there is only negatives. Something like mobile technology, there is positives. There is a wealth of information available on the internet. The, the heightened communication can be a really good thing. We just need to teach people how to use it responsibly. It's not the same as something like drugs or something like alcohol, where the vast majority of the side effects are negative. We can find positive effects from it. So I think we're talking about two different things here. So I absolutely agree with that with the internet, and I don't think any sane person would say children should never be allowed on the internet. I think what many of us have an issue with is the internet in children's pockets 24 7 with no control you know through that device children are exposed to an array of harmful content they would never come into contact with in the real world nor would they come into contact with it likely in their bedrooms where they can be monitored and supervised by parents this you know phones take that control away from parents and it puts so much harm in the way of children uh, there are safeguarded controls that can be implemented, though, and if a parent's really concerned about what a child is doing when the parent's not watching, the parent can just watch. 
that is, that is something they can do. Well, it's, they can't. It's they not can't the same when the phone's in, you know, the phone's in the child's pocket and the child's in school or on the way to school. So, you know, the, that, that option has been taken away from the parents. I think parental co controls absolutely agree there are parental controls. Many children find their way around parental controls. And again, parental controls don't work in a world where many other children are not subject to the same control because you have that element of peer pressure. But in the same way as a child or a young person can find a way around parental control, they'll find a way around government controls as well. I think you, you probably see it all the time. I'm not sure what the actual um, age restriction is on something like Facebook, but I, I certainly remember not that long ago when I was probably under that age at school, everybody just put in a fake age. It is easy to get around. So the better thing to do is find a way to teach everyone to use it responsibly. Don't just ban it and pretend the problem goes away, because it doesn't. And then you just push the problem later on. All you will do will have a generation of young people who get to 16, 17, suddenly are, you know, greeted with this wealth of information and communication ability, and then you're just assuming the problems that have plagued them whilst they're a young or a younger person won't exist then. It's complete, complete nonsense. Final thought? I think it's a got, to, got to the point, let, let's take an analogy of road safety. So, you know, would we let our children go out on the roads in the world where there were no road safety limits, where drivers were advised and educated about what might happen if you drove at 60 miles an hour in a village, but actually there was no rule preventing that? Of course we wouldn't let our children go out in that environment. It would just be dangerous, and that is where we are with social media. Final thought? Uh, we need to be teaching people to be responsible and teach them how to use these absolutely amazing tools that humanity has invented. Don't be regressive. Don't be the people that said no to paper and yes to the, st yes to the stone tablet. We need to look forward and be ambitious. OK, good to see you both. Good argument. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Other news for you. Undercover Israeli troops dressed as civilian women and medics have stormed a hospital in the West Bank, killing three people Israel claimed were militants. Uh, the three people who were killed, Israel says, were planning an attack. Our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, is in the Jordanian capital for us. Um, hello to you, Dominic. Uh, tell us more about what happened. Well, Kay, what they're worried about here is, is the, the, the war that um, is raging in Gaza and is spreading into the West Bank uh, with more and more activity uh, carried out by the IDF in Janine and attacks by Palestinian fighters uh, against them. They're worried here about that spreading uh, across the rest of the region. We went to a town near the American base that was attacked by an Iranian-backed militia, killing three American soldiers. Uh, in, in that town, a pretty poor sort of one-dog town, border town, people there were very worried about the, the dangers of this war, uh, these tensions that have begun in Gaza, spreading and rippling across uh, the region, and particularly in the light of that attack on, on that base. Um, and the latest on that case is rather intriguing because the group that's, I think, at the top of the list, really, effectively, of, of the Americans' of, uh, suspect list for this attack on this base is Kataib Hezbollah. That is an Iranian-backed uh, militia group um, that kind of lurks in the deserts of uh, Western Iran. Uh, and is believed to have been responsible or certainly part of a group uh, of groups that might have attacked this base. Now, that group, Qatar Hezbollah, has said it's not going to attack any more bases. It's it announced a temporary suspension of, of attacks on the American military. It says it's going to be engaged now in passive defence. So the news that um, this group has now become pacifist, I think, will be treated sceptically uh, in Washington, but it certainly gives the impression, at least, of some kind of de-escalation in what is a very tense, nervous moment for the region as we wait to hear what kind of reprisals America uh, will launch uh, in return for the attacks on this base. It is a nerve-wracking moment. I think there's no doubt that uh, Joe Biden will launch some kind of attack. And the risk, of course, is that at such a, a tinderbox moment in the region, whatever he does could lead to a much greater escalation. That's certainly what is exercising minds here, at least. Dominic, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, let's tell you about Chita Rivera. Remember the Broadway star whose career spans seven decades? She sadly de died at the age of uh, 91 following a brief illness. I like to be in America, okay by me in America, everything free in America, for a small fee in America. From hitting the big time in the original production of West Side Story in 1957 to Chicago and Kiss of the Spider Woman, She's been described as a true Broadway icon. Rivera was nominated for 10 Tony Awards, winning twice. Still to come on The Breakfast Show for you, Wilf will be joining us, talking about why Elon Musk has taken umbrage with the state of Delaware 
over his pay packet. Police commentator Graham Wetton is with me to look at crime statistics. There is a, a lot of gas being fired all around us. It is an absolute carnival kind of atmosphere out here for Prime Minister Modi's decisive victory. These students are defying the prohibitory orders and now they're going to be arrested. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. The roads have been inundated. The only way out is to get people by boat. What is feared that over 200 people might have died because of these landslides. This on any given day would have been bustling with people, but today it's absolutely deserted. This is one of the most sensitive areas of, uh, of Northeast Delhi where there's been clashes. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Hello again, everybody. You're watching The Breakfast Show here on Sky News. Wilfred standing by for us. Elon Musk. Let's talk about him, should we? My goodness me, he's very upset this morning, isn't he? He is indeed. Talking about Elon Musk for the second day in the row. Uh, that's, uh, that's how interesting he always is. So, uh, in the headlines today and upset, as you rightly say, because a Delaware court is potentially claiming back some $56 billion dollars uh, of his pay in recent years, and just to, for context, Kay, 56 billion, he's worth about 210 billion overall, uh, and of that 210, 132 billion comes from his stake in Tesla, and now this 56 billion of that 132 billion of his stake in Tesla, uh, Delaware Court's trying to claim back from him. Okay, now, just, just explain to us in a bit more detail what happened, because 56 billion was part of his package that the board agreed on some five years ago. Yep. Um, and he says he wanted it as a way to get humanity to Mars. Yeah, what? so exactly. That was part of his testimony in the court case when it was heard uh, actually back in November 22. So it, it's been draw, drawn out this. It, it was a, a, an award by the board in January 2018. And at the time, it was somewhat ludicrous. It was sort of pushed through by the nine person board, of which at least five, if you look through the names back then, were very, very close allies for him. And of course, by this point, even though he kind of controlled the company, it was publicly listed, so he was meant to play by the rules. The corporate governance was pretty terrible back then. Interestingly, they did set uh, a lot of targets for him 
to meet to get a lot of this pay. And the performance since then has been phenomenal. When, when the award was given, the company is worth 60 billion. Today, it's worth 600 billion. But this shareholder who didn't like the, approval, the award of the, the pay back then um, has found holes in it and found holes in the corporate governance uh, in the award. So it remains to be seen if Musk appeals successfully or not. But at the moment, he's going to have to give back this 56 billion. OK, um, for now, thanks, Wolf. Wolf joining us um, from 10 to 11.30. He's so upset about this, Elon Musk, that he's, he's uh, opened a poll for you to get involved with on X or Twitter, as you uh, prefer. And he wants to know whether he should relocate uh, his um, business from Delaware to Texas. Um, obviously, he's pushing at an open door with his followers on um, Twitter. X, and they are resoundingly have said up till now, absolutely, that's what you need to do. Go to Texas, they'll be much nicer to you. Let us know your thoughts if you would like to. Pleased to say Graham Wetton's here, our police commentator. There were some crime stats out yesterday, weren't they? Mm -hmm. How accurate are they when we look at crime stats? They're one source of information. So they're a small snapshot, really. They're from face-to-face -face interviews. Um, with households. So it's about, I think, 30,000 they interviewed, or the sur they surveyed. And it limits to basically uh, residents of households that, and their experiences of crime. So it doesn't cover commercial premises. So it's one piece of information. So as in most things in life, media and policing, it's a piece of information that you take with other sources of information to actually get a, bit, a bigger picture. So police recorded crime stats are only crimes that are re reported to police, whereas a survey may capture some of the offences. OK, so what's it saying? So overall, Overall crime, so that's all crime, is down. There's a downward trend, but as your viewers will probably know, there's so many crimes being reported that the perception of crime is up. So you take both together, there are some elements of crime that are going up, online okay. fraud, cyber crime, knife crime. There are other elements, some burglaries, that are going down. So you have to look at the whole picture. So from a policing perspective, it's a piece of information, the source of information that you, you take on board with everything else you've got, you know. Most officers know they're crime hotspots where crimes are happening. And they look at the data. We did a piece a couple of weeks ago about the, the watch robberies, where officers were going out in the West End with watches on because they could target an area and a time and a place that they knew offences were likely to take place. So in policing, you take all sorts of information to look at where the crimes are happening. OK. Um, how many people tend to follow up? So if you report a crime, you get a CAD number, I think it's called? You get a crime number. Yeah, yeah OK. And or a CAD number, you're right. Yeah. And then what happens? And do, do people tend to follow up on those subsequently? Because I know I've sort of had interactions with the police a couple of times, but I've never followed up. I just think, oh, those police officers are very busy. I won't trouble them. That is, that is one aspect. Yeah, some people don't. Some people do. It depends as well on the... And across the country, forces have got different investigative aspects. And some people... Some forces have got um, smaller units that will investigate the crime for you. Most of them, it's response police officers. So you're, you're reporting your crime to an officer who's either early turn, lates or nights. So you can only do your inquiries, your phone calls to your victim at reasonable times. You can't you come in at 10 or 11 o'clock at night and think, bring something up about something that happened a week ago, you're not going to get a very good response. So some people don't follow them up. Um, they just report it. In many occasions, they just want that reference number for maybe an insurance claim because you need an insurance, a reference number for an insurance claim. Mm. So it really depends on the person. Some people will follow it up and make, you know, bring the officer up and want to know what's happening with their crime. It depends on the investigative leads that officer has for that particular offence. Final thought before I let you go. Mm. What about officers who are not always, who perhaps fall foul of the law themselves, are looking at the stats? Yeah. Uh, police officers found guilty of crimes last year after a complaint of uh, misconduct or an investigation of that rose 70%. No one wants wrong policers, police officers out of policing more than police officers. So, this is part of a, a campaign, um, an operation across the country by all forces to revet and look at the, the people that are within policing due to the highly publicised recent stories involving serving officers committing crimes. So, rightly so, policing is having a look at it itself internally, identifying people that shouldn't be in policing and taking action to get rid of them. And that's the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, very, very tiny majority. A small minority. Yeah. Um, it's good to see you. Thanks Thank you. very much indeed. Thank you. A uh, quick look at the weather for you. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.
Wet and windy conditions will sweep into Scotland overnight with rain spreading south through the day. Yellow wind warnings are in place for the northern half of the country with storm force winds expected in the far north and gusts in excess of 50 miles an hour for northern England. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Siobhan and the rest of the gang are here. Didn't even hear her coming this time, did we? <laughs> Talk to me about pharmacies. Well, nine out of ten community pharmacists will now be offering a pharmacy first service, which basically means for people that may need uh, some help with common illnesses, things like sore throats and earaches, we'll be able to go to the pharmacy first for treatment without seeing a GP first. It's hoped that uh, if it's successful, around 10 million GP appointments could be freed up each year. And it'll be a game changer, especially for people that work full time that already struggle to get a GP appointment. What are the downsides? Well, the downsides, as usual, is the money because we've already heard about many community pharmacists struggling. They say that basically the price of medicine, the price that they get from the NHS, is not uh, match the increase um, in the cost of medicine. So the government have said that they are uh, committing around six hundred and forty-five million pounds to this scheme. But we have heard from some associations that at the minute there's a shortfall of around one point two. Billion. Mm, apparently, Rishi Sunak's mother was a pharmacist. She, he never mentioned it. <laughs> I know. Never. What a surprise. Shock. <laughs> yeah, and he used to do the accounts there and work there on Saturdays yeah. <laughs> and deliver the prescriptions on his bike. Well, there you go. How, but... how he grew to love business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the um, Labour Party is saying that's all well and good, but branch, uh, root and branch reform of the NHS is what need, is needed. Yes, and there was a, a warning last year as well that because GP f surgeries are trying to attract pharmacists from community pharmacists, there was a, a phrase, a quote, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, and you're just moving that issue around. And, and of a survey of 6,000 pharmacies last year, 71% of community pharmacies said they had a staffing shortfall. So there is, like, like Labour pointed out, a bigger issue at play here. Mm. So what are the what if you've got bites, insect bites, sore throat, yes, sore throat, cold. earache. Uh, if you uh, have a urinary tract infection, um, but a woman under the under age 65. of sixty-five, mm. yeah, and uh, many other sort of common illnesses. It's important to add as well that pharmacies already offer contraceptive uh, prescriptions as well as uh, blood pressure uh, checks as well. So it'll be adding to those services. Okay. Um, We'll leave it there for now, um, team. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to be talking about a picture that's on the front page of a lot of the papers this morning. The two most important ladies who are members of Sinn Féin. They can see the United Ireland in the distance. What does the British government think about that? Stay tuned. Bye now.
Hello, everybody. Very good morning. Nine o'clock on today's programme. Brexit is back. Yes, we had an interesting comment from the Minister on that and whether or not flower sellers here should import from Europe in the face of rising costs. Plus, the bulldozers move in around the soon-to-be-demolished spa at the home of Captain Tom's daughter. Never take on the planners. It's Wednesday, the 31st of January. The government pours cold water on Sinn Féin's suggestion of a future united island after a breakthrough on power sharing in Stormont. Telling this programme... Yeah, Call cool your jets, Mary Lou Macdonald, because it's not happening. Is that what you're saying? I, in my in my world, I would go a very long way to make sure that didn't happen yet. That Northern Ireland is an integral part, a much loved part of the United Kingdom. Also, Brexit red tape. Could new customs controls coming in today force up the price of food for British consumers? The pharmacist will see you now. We'll tell you what ailments you can now get treatment for without seeing a GP. Big day at the COVID inquiry as Nicola Sturgeon prepares to give evidence with their life. Extreme weather warning after the storms, now the sun in the spotlight as MPs say 10,000 people could die as a result of heat waves. I like to be in America, okay by me in America, everything free in America, for a small fee in America, nothing free. Tributes to the Broadway icon, Chita Rivera, whose career spanned seven decades. She's died at the age of 91. Morning, everyone. Two political hot potatoes for you this morning. Brexit and that DUP deal about power sharing in Northern Ireland. More on Brexit very shortly. And an interesting thought from the government on whether flower sellers should still import from Europe or just give up in the face of rising costs. Meanwhile, the government minister with us this morning has poured cold water on Sinn Féin's suggestion of a future united Ireland after a breakthrough on power sharing in Stormont. We'll start with that. I absolutely will do everything possible to ensure that Northern Ireland remains part of the UK internal market, that we respect totally the challenges in Northern Ireland. And I think that what the government has done in providing a package of support to Northern Ireland that has enabled um, the DUP party leaders to come together and decide to reform the Stormont Assembly is brilliant news. OK, and, so yeah, call your jets, Mary Lou Macdonald, because it's not happening, is that what you're saying? Uh, in, my, in my world, I would go a very long way to make sure that didn't happen yet, that Northern Ireland is an integral part, a much-loved part of the United Kingdom. It could cause a few problems down the track. Well, indeed, particularly considering the whole reason about the DUP not wanting to be part of the power sharing executive is because of their concern that Northern Ireland was being pushed away um, from the rest of Great Britain um, by, firstly, that... Uh, Bar that barrier to trade down the Northern Irish Sea as part of the uh, the Irish Sea as part of the Boris Johnson's Brexit deal. Um, now they feel that they've actually um, abolished many of those barriers to trade with the rest of Great Britain through this deal, abolishing the Green Lane. Obviously, we're waiting to find out all the details later on today. Um, but that's really what it's all about for them. And so now having this discussion uh, prompted last night by Mary Lou Macdonald, the president of Sinn Féin, um, saying that the days of partition are now numbered because, of course, the re restoration of power sharing means that the First Minister will be the leader of the largest party um, in Northern Ireland, which is now Sinn Féin, um, Michelle O'Neill. So that will be a historic moment. Um, but obviously, you can see why Sinn Féin, this is their raison d'etre, this is why um, that, that is exactly what they want to see happening ultimately. But for Angela Ledson to kind of engage in it in this way is, is, is really fascinating. Um, and um, and um, Mary Lou Macdonald could... could be the president of Ireland, so we could see Sinn Féin in charge both sides of that north-south border. Well, yes, yeah, she's the opposition leader at the moment in Ireland, and then um, absolutely, I mean, if you if you could see those two two women in charge on both sides of the border, I mean, that's quite an a, a extraordinary moment. But indeed, I've also the government itself, their position is all has always been that the union is primarily important, Northern Ireland key place within that, but equally within the Good Friday Agreement, it does enshrine the fact that uh, Northern Ireland's always going to be part of the UK unless the people choose otherwise. <laughs> there we go. There's the rub. Let's see what happens. Thanks very much, Amanda. Bear with me, because we also asked the Minister about post-Brexit checks on food. 
uh, on plants and animal imports from the EU that come into force today. I know I thought Brexit was done as well. The cost to British businesses could be hundreds of millions of pounds annually pushing up prices. We ask whether the government thinks flower sellers, for example, should continue to import to the UK from Europe, despite the cost, or buy locally. Our business correspondent Paul Kelso reports. At New Covent Garden Market, they're gearing up for Valentine's Day. But the course of true love and free trade may not run smooth this year. From today, for the first time, imported cut flowers face Brexit border checks. Valentine's Day is crazy. It's one of the biggest, biggest days of the floristry calendar, and it's worldwide. So um, flowers are shipped through Holland everywhere. Um, so, I mean, our borders are now causing us an issue with that. To pass British Customs, imported flowers now need a health certificate signed off by a European plant inspector. These new rules mean that some of the most popular flowers, orchids, chrysanthemums imported from Europe, will need paperwork and, in time, checks at the border. The rules have already been delayed five times in the last three years. But for this trade, eight years after the vote, Brexit isn't done. It's only just beginning. It's not just flowers, food imports including cheese, dairy and eggs and chilled and frozen meat and fish for which the UK relies heavily on EU imports are also affected. The government says the checks will prevent pests and diseases like swine flu but admits this new red tape will cost businesses £330 million a year and increase food inflation. I know this is absolute anathema to the current government that we should sit down with the European Union negotiate a comprehensive veterinary agreement based on alignment. Uh, that would wipe away this problem overnight, remove all the costs. It would also significantly resolve the issues uh, in relation to goods moving to Northern Ireland. Officials say they'll be pragmatic and do not expect disruption. But the reality of Brexit is trade barriers at the border. Paul Kelso, Sky News. Well, Paul is here with us now. I know you were listening to the minister a little bit uh, mm. earlier on. Andrea Leadsom, uh, we were asking whether small businesses should stop buying from Europe and turn to the UK instead. So, I mean, I've had many constituency cases over the years of people who've changed their trading arrangements with the European Union as a result of different frictions, whether it's postal costs changing, whether it's um, border so controls and Europe, so on. Is that what you're no, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that businesses need to adapt to meet the changing environment. There are huge opportunities so from the rest do? of the world. Well, I don't know her particular circumstances. She can't afford the flowers that, and the extra increase that it's going to cost her to get the cheques before she brings them over from the Netherlands. So there are many parts of the United Kingdom that are flower growers themselves, and there are other parts of so the world So she shouldn't buy from Europe, that's well, what you're saying. I'm not saying that at all. I'm well, just you saying are. I don't know her exactly circumstances. What you're and obviously, what some businesses will do is continue to trade with the EU and absorb those costs. What do you think she was saying? It sounded like she was saying uh, you should favour British growers of flowers, which is, won't get you very far at this time of year, certainly not in the run-up to Valentine's Day, which is a huge peak for the industry, um, or Mother's Day to come after that. I think what Andrea... It's very interesting to have Andrea Leadsom on today. She was a business secretary, she was a key Brexiteer campaigner. To have her on today at the moment with these Brexit border controls actually bite is very instructive because essentially the arguments from her are the same as they were way back which is that this is the price of imposing controls at our border this is an inevitable cost of leaving the customs union and the single market of course the counter to that is leaving the cust leaving those that hard brexit wasn't a given when the vote was taken it took years to get to that point as we're seeing in northern ireland eight years on it's still not certain resolved the kind of controls that are being brought in on the GB border today are exactly the ones that Northern Ireland today is trying to make sure don't apply between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So these, it sounds technical, it's paperwork and the rest of it, but this is the absolute meat and drink of Brexit and it's still not fully resolved. OK. Um, are we listening to what Labour says or we don't fancy that? OK, we'll come back to it. Um, uh, Gareth. Yes, I'm going to talk to you now about pharmacies because there's change in the rules that are being brought in and suggested by the government, talking about how much you trust your pharmacist. And they'll now be able to treat seven common conditions without you needing to see a doctor. That includes sinusitis, sore throats, earaches, infected insect bites, impetigo, shingles and uncomplicated urinary tract infections in women under the age of 65. 
From 10 o'clock, Nicola Sturgeon is expected to give evidence at the COVID inquiry in Edinburgh in the toughest test of her stewardship of the pandemic so far. And a warning, there's some flash photography coming up next. This was the moment the former First Minister arrived there this morning. The inquiry is looking at decision-making between early January and late March 2020 when the first national lockdown was imposed. Our Scotland correspondent, Connor Gillies, is there. Connor. Yeah, anticipation is palpable here in Edinburgh for the big moment that kicks off in less than one hour's time. Nicola Sturgeon facing her biggest interrogation yet. Uh, about her stewardship of Scotland's uh, pandemic. Clearly, her reputation is on the line as well, given the uproar that has been witnessed in the last few weeks around the deletion of her WhatsApp. She has said that she wiped all of her pandemic-related exchanges in line with Scottish government policy, but the COVID-bereaved have been furious at that, and they will be looking for answers here over the course of today during what will be a marathon event session. The stakes are very high. There will also be questions about the type of premiership that Nicola Sturgeon conducted herself during the course of the pandemic. Was it too uh, presidential style? Was there too many decisions made within a tight-knit group of her closest allies? Was the power not evenly distributed across the whole of her cabinet? Uh, those will be questions that she will face uh, over the course of uh, today. And we'll bring that to you live here on Sky News from 10 o'clock. Connor, thank you. A militant group that's among those suspected of an attack that killed three US soldiers is pausing operations to prevent embarrassment to the Iraqi government. The Iran line group, Qatar Hezbollah, is one of several factions that American officials believe may have carried out the drone attack on a US airbase in Jordan. Joe Biden has confirmed he's made up his mind about how to respond, but hasn't outlined what that will involve. Elon Musk is threatening to move the tax base of his company Tesla. That's after a judge in Delaware blocked the board from giving him a $56 billion pay packet. He's polled his followers asking whether to move the company from where it's incorporated in Delaware to Texas, where the company's headquarters are. So far, the vast majority agree. Emails released by the BBC show how Martin Bashir told colleagues that professional jealousy was to blame for allegations that he secured an interview with Princess Diana through deceit. The journalist wrote the message in 2020, months before a BBC Panorama interview exposed the scandal surrounding his infamous 1995 interview in which she said of her relationship with the then Prince Charles, there were three of us in this marriage. A damning report found that Bashir had faked bank statements and showed them to Earl Spencer, Diana's brother, in order to gain access to the princess. We're seeing increasing numbers of heat waves here in the UK, and 2023 was also the hottest year on record. Ivor Bennett now looks at whether we're ready for what's being dubbed the silent killer. The fear is we're under attack, and the weapon is the weather. Extreme heat no longer a freak event, but seen as a fixture of our summits, which MPs say will prove a silent killer if the UK doesn't act. It's here, it's a present danger, and it's coming at us quite quickly. And so we looked again at how resilient is the UK to the impact of higher temperatures, and we found that there is really a lot of work that needs to be done. Up to 10,000 people a year could die if nothing is done, according to the Environmental Audit Committee, with the elderly and vulnerable most at risk. And they say the threat is to both physical health and mental. It's normally this kind of weather and the gloomy winter that's associated with causing low mood and depression. But MPs are warning heat can have the same effect too, with potentially deadly consequences. According to their report, when the temperature goes from 22 degrees to 32 degrees, the suicide risk in the UK doubles. So what can be done? One suggestion is to name heat waves, like we do storms, to increase public awareness of the dangers. It's clear that Britain still thinks of itself as a cold country that celebrates periods of heat by talking about going to the beach and eating ice cream, when in actual fact it's an extreme weather event that leads to thousands of deaths. We have to alter our perception. There are also calls to retrofit homes and offices to make them cooler. 
An overheated workforce costs the economy an estimated £60 billion a year. But the biggest fear is the cost to life. Ivor Bennett, Sky News. Uh, with that in mind, here's a look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to sponsored by Qatar Airways. Wet and windy conditions will sweep into Scotland overnight with rain spreading south through the day. Yellow wind warnings are in place for the northern half of the country with storm force winds expected in the far north and gusts in excess of 50 miles an hour for northern England. The bulk of the country will be dry overnight with a frost in areas where sky is clear for any length of time. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Still to come, why a new Conservative housing policy promises British homes for British people. It's facing criticism. I've been discussing that with the Housing Minister Lee Rowley. More on that shortly. We'll also get the rundown of the latest political stories with The Spectator's political editor Katie Balls and the editor of Politics UK, that's Ian Dunt. And scaffolding goes up at the spa pool block of Captain Tom's daughter in preparation for demolition. I'm Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world, the likes of Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Sir Elton John. We try to give you an honest sense of how these people really are. There's always more to the news than a headline. We want to discover, to delve a little deeper, to find out what's really going on. Explanation, analysis, the people at the heart of every story. I'm Neil Patterson, and this is the Sky News Daily Podcast. Alex Crawford joining us now from Ukraine. Their personal possessions are all scattered around the place. Our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, try and make sense of uh, the big numbers for us. Things can change incredibly quickly, and that's what they have done. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Hello again, everybody. Welcome uh, back to the programme. KG Lester is with me. He lives in social housing campaigner uh, from the London Renters Union. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. We thought we'd invite him in after an interview that we did yesterday with the government minister about uh, British homes for British people. This is what he said. 
Fundamentally, with social housing being that finite resource, which I've just talked about, we have to make sure it's used in a way which works and which prioritises people who need it the most, but also people who play by the rules. OK, so you're further down the list if you're not British or have indefinitely... Well, we'll, well, we'll consult, but we are seeking to prioritise in in, out of this, following the consultation. Is that fair? Of course it's fair. It's fair that people who've been here for a long time, who have paid into the system, get the better access to social housing, which is a precious and finite resource. And that's fair, KG Lester. What would you say in response to that? I think it's grossly unfair. And I think making a statement like that is quite divisive. And for me, it's almost harkening back to the days of Enoch Powell and the Rivers of Blood speech. Um, it's, for me, it's, it's definitely dog whistle politics and it has a very underlying racial element to it. Um, you can't blame migrants for the mess that the Tories have made with the housing. It's an absolute disgrace. But you say dog whistle politics. I'm sure that a lot of people watching this morning would say, yes, I am British, yes, I have paid my taxes all of my life, or I've, I've been indefinite leave to remain for 10 years or more. Of course I should have uh, first dibs. Yes, I mean, I can understand that, that viewpoint as well, but one thing that needs to happen is there needs to be more social housing built, and the government has failed on that. Um, you know, we're in one of the richest economies uh, in the world, and really there shouldn't be a housing crisis at all, as far as I'm concerned. What's your experience of social housing? Um, I've been a social housing tenant for 25 years. Um, when I first got my property, it was back in 1999, um, and it was actually the council, so I had a council property, and unfortunately that uh, got bought out by a, a housing association, and things went downhill in terms of the service from there. Um, but I remember, I call it the good old days, you know, um, back then when I, when I actually had, uh, you know, was, was offered a property, things were different, it was, you know, an, an easier system. So, do you think it all uh, dates back to councils selling off their housing stock? That's where the problem started. Absolutely, absolutely. And that dates back to Margaret Thatcher's era. So, it's been some yes. time. Have, why have we not um, built more housing or uh, f found other ways of improving the situation for people like you? Yeah, well, I mean, this, this is part of the problem. Why haven't we built more social housing? Because, you know, for me, that will solve a lot of problems. And I don't know why the government is not taking the steps to actually build more social housing, because that's what we need. I mean, it, it's not going to be the uh, sort of be-all solution, but it, it would help. What sort of advice do you offer to people who find themselves in a similar position to you where, you know, it's not about getting your first step on the housing ladder, it's actually about just having a roof over your head in any way? I think for a lot of people, they just want a decent home. People are not looking for palaces, they just want a home that's affordable, a home that is, you know, uh, is decent, a home that doesn't have mould or damp or any disrepair issues. And landlords and housing associations have a responsibility to make sure that that happens for a lot of people, and, and, what, it, and it's not. What responsibility should the state, the government, have for that? Uh, the government has a lot of responsibility. I mean, they are uh, ploughing in investment into lots of different areas. Housing is one area that's seriously lacking, as far as I'm concerned. And I think what they need to do is invest in social housing a lot more than what they're doing now. Okay. They're just not doing their jobs, as far as I'm concerned. But I did speak to Labour as well yesterday, and they basically were underlining what the government said, which was, uh, going back to where we started, British homes for British people. Uh, <laughs> I mean... You know, uh, as part of London Renters' Union, we are not aligned to any particular party. And I know that the front bencher, Peter Kyle, said that uh, if they get into power, they'll build, um, they'll build a million uh, houses a year. And I think, well, that's a grand gesture, but as long as, from that investment, there's a lot that goes into social housing. Okay. I think that really needs to happen. KG, it's good to see you. Thanks Thank for you. taking the time. I Thanks really appreciate having me. it. Thank you. Uh, let me tell you about other news uh, now, and it relates to Chita Rivera. You may think you don't know the name, but you do. She was a Broadway star whose career spanned seven decades. She's died at the age of 91 following a brief illness. I like to be in America, OK by me in America, everything free in America, for a small fee in America. From hitting the big time in the original production of West Side Story in 1957 to Chicago and Kiss of the Spider Woman, she's been described as a true Broadway icon. Rivera was nominated for 10 Tony Awards, winning twice. Still to come on The Breakfast Show for you.
We're going to be getting the rundown of the latest political stories with the Spectator's political editor Katie Balls and the editor of Politics UK, Ian Dunt. Again, everybody, you're watching The Breakfast Show here on Sky News. I want to talk about Captain Tom. Mm, we certainly do, and the reports that the scaffolding's gone up around that spa that his family built. Controversial in. spa. Controversial spa, to say the least, because it was built under the name of the Captain Tom Foundation. You can see it there. You can see the scaffolding going up as well. And it was going to be used as part of the Charitable Foundation's activities. And then during the building, the goalposts moved somewhat, and it then said that it was going to be used, the, the pool kitchen and, and toilets for private use, and the council went, hang on a second, that's not what we agreed to. You shouldn't mess with them, should you? And now they've been told they have to demolish it because they didn't have the correct planning permission. And actually, it looks like that is what's, what's happening, which isn't always the case. Sometimes you hear of these kind of crazy buildings going up that end up, uh, you know, it takes years for them. Retrospective planning permission. Yeah. But mm. the council are having none of it. They're no. saying it needs to be down by the 7th of February. What happens on the 8th? On the 8th, the council come along and check that it's definitely gone, don't they? Yeah. So, I, But I'm, sh I'm sure the press will tell them mm. long before that. And it's just part of this wider oh. questions around the activities of his, of his family since his death with regards to the Charitable Foundation, the profits from the books. It's, it's overshadowed the £38 million that he raised during the pandemic. Yeah, and he was a national treasure. He absolutely was. I mean, it was so, such a bleak time, wasn't it? And then suddenly seeing this 101-year-old guy raising money that started out as something he wanted to raise £100 or something by walking up and down the garden and then seeing the millions and millions that poured in, how he was knighted by the Queen. I mean, it was a real symbol of hope, wasn't it, during lockdown? And then obviously, very sadly, he died um, in 2021. And, but since then, the, the, the kind of the legacy has been tarnished by all these stories coming out so 
surrounding his family and there's been it was so high profile that there was such a, there's been such a tension on them isn't there i guess that's partly why the council have been so strict on it exactly that almost half past nine which means it's time for the headlines it certainly does and we'll start with a government minister saying they have discounted the idea of a united island after it was suggested by Sinn Féin's Mary Lou Macdonald yesterday. The party's president made the comments following a breakthrough instalment on power sharing. Post-Brexit checks on food, plant and animal imports from the European Union come into force today. Meat and dairy, fruit and veg and even cut flowers will all require specific health certificates. Pharmacies will be able to treat seven common conditions without patients needing to see a doctor. The scheme is expected to free up around 10 million NHS GP appointments every year. Nicola Sturgeon gives evidence at the Scottish COVID inquiry today in the toughest test of her stewardship of the pandemic so far. Expect her to be asked about her WhatsApp messages from the time, which were wiped from her phone before the inquiry. And we're waiting for a news conference, which uh, will happen very shortly. Before that, Katie and Ian are here with us. Very frustrating. It must be for all of these WhatsApp messages that just go poof. Yeah, it's um, really quite something. And uh, obviously, with, I think, lots of the Boris Johnson, Dominic Cummings evidence, lots of focus on the WhatsApp messages. Rishi and Sunak. Yeah, well, his, his disappeared. So yeah. when we see them, they often have bad language. Um, oh, Rishi Sunak has mysteriously yes. disappeared. And now we have a situation where I think just the scale of these messages being missing, and then the messages that are in terms of the culture clearly in the Scottish government at the time of almost um, joking about clearing your messages at the end of the day and that type of thing, it does feel as though there is a culture of secrecy. Yeah. We've got to get a hand on, look, if, if this is the medium by which serious decisions are being made, we cannot just keep on ending up in this position. This is not, it's clearly not a left-right issue. It's clearly not sort of like a Scottish or an English issue or a nationalist or a unionist issue. You're seeing it across parties, across persuasions. It's very tempting. And you can kind of understand how tempting it is because we all kind of revert to WhatsApp as a really kind of fluid, easy way to communicate. This is not an acceptable situation that we're in right now. It's not acceptable what's going on in Scotland. It's not acceptable what was taking place in Westminster. Clearly, we need to get a hand on this. If it's a matter of historical record, then it should be exactly that, I'm, I'm guessing. Exactly. Exactly. And I think if you are going to do government by WhatsApp, to Ian's point, I think you'll need more checks. But instead, we seem to be going the other way because as you've had the COVID inquiries, I'm sure we've all noticed this, uh, you know, more and more politicians have disappearing messages on. Uh, I have noticed that, yeah. <laughs> And so, also, so I think, if anything, the messages that have existed that have come out um, have discouraged everyone further from, you know, putting things on WhatsApp that will remain there for more than 24 hours. Uh, talk to me about um, the Shin two uh, strongest ladies in um, Sinn Féin saying they can see a united island on the horizon. And we had Andrea Leadsom on this morning, who basically said, over my dead body. Yeah, that's not the most useful language to be using she today. She didn't say exactly that, but I'm and, just quoting her. Actually, in this rare example, I'm not talking about Andrea Letson, I'm actually talking about what's going on with Sinn Féin. Can, because... thought? Can we come back to it? Because I just want to hear from the bereaved uh, families up in Scotland today. Short statement as Miss Sturgeon is due to begin her evidence at 10 o'clock. Nicola Sturgeon, I'm uh, sorry, um, just... Sorry. My name's Amar Amwar, I'm the lead solicitor for the Scottish COVID bereaved. Nicola Sturgeon, as First Minister, became Scotland's master of spin, but today she will be facing the greatest trial she has ever faced to date. There will be no hiding place, no toleration of spin, no acceptance of sorrow-filled apologies. The Scottish COVID bereaved deserved and expect the truth. In comparison to let the bodies pile up high Boris Johnson, Nicola Sturgeon projected a daily image of sincerity in wanting to do right by the people of Scotland during the pandemic. But that carefully crafted image has been left shattered by the hands of Miss Sturgeon herself. Those who lost loved ones were convinced that they would no longer be invisible in their misery and Miss Sturgeon would do everything possible to illuminate the truth. That was the very least she owed to those who lost their lives to COVID. But today, Nicola Sturgeon stands accused of a betrayal of the many promises that she made, including that nothing would be off limits in the public inquiries. Her industrial deletion of WhatsApps, along with those in her inner circle, begs the question why, when she knew a public inquiry was on its way. Why from January 2020 
to the 1st of September 2020 are there zero WhatsApps and rather conveniently none for Inner Circle 2. Last week, her former Chief of Staff, Liz Lloyd, provided WhatsApp messages that provided much laughter and many front pages in Miss Sturgeon's description of Mr. Johnson as a clown. The COVID bereaved were not so easily fooled by such spin. They wanted to know what happened before those texts, what decisions were discussed from the months of the 1st of January 2020, what was happening with PPE, why our care homes were being turned into killing fields, our hospitals and our frontline workers who in their thousands were risking their lives. No one has dared to ask the question what bearing the trial of Alex Salmond or Operation Branch Form had on the deletion of WhatsApps, but the bereaved expect answers today. Whilst there are those in this country who view everything through the myopic vision of independence versus unionism, quite frankly, the Scottish COVID bereaved care not one bit. They fight for those who lost their lives to COVID. As a former First Minister and lawyer, Ms Sturgeon would of course know there are severe consequences for those in power who choose to delete information with the intention of preventing its disclosure to a public inquiry. In what can only be seen as a cynical, premeditated decision, it ought to have been blindingly obvious to the politicians and civil servants from 2020 onwards that their contemporaneous messages may be of relevance to a public inquiry. My clients have asked me to consider asking for a criminal investigation into the actions of the former First Minister and others. We will carefully consider our next steps once her evidence is completed today and we have had an opportunity to view the several thousand pages of documents disclosed to the inquiry by the Scottish Government in recent days. I said at the start of this process that no individual, no matter how powerful, can be allowed to interfere with the pursuit of truth, justice and accountability by this inquiry. Those who lost their lives to COVID-19 deserve nothing less. There will be a full press conference at one o'clock once Ms Sturgeon started her evidence and questions and answers of one-to-ones and then once she's completed her evidence. OK, thank you. Criminal investigation potential? Yeah, I think uh, that would be obviously worrying uh, to Nicola Sturgeon. I think the question, of course, is how would you get to that point? But clearly from that press conference, um, talking about the COVID bereaved, that group of those who you know, lost uh, friends and family during that period, I think the deletion of messages is clearly what they're zoning in on and suggesting if that was done purposely, willfully, if that was done as a, as a you know, with the intention of concealing information about decision making, could that then cross over into criminality? Mm. Yeah. That was extremely punchy. It was. Um, quite aggressive. It kind of gives you an indication of, we see so much around COVID, around the sort of prism of our kind of domestic politics. So, like, lots of the attacks on Boris Johnson, people like myself are sort of like, well, look, this guy's clearly incompetent during the COVID period. How could you trust him with it? So, you see, actually, there's a similar pattern going on there when he says, we cannot just see this through the prism of sort of, you know, Scottish independence or not. It doesn't matter whether you happen to agree with her on the political viewpoints. As it happens, I think she's a tremendously accomplished politician. Even looking at those images of her getting the jab there, you remember that she was quite a reassuring presence in comparison to what seemed like a much more chaotic administration in London. You still have to hold people to the same standards, regardless of whether you like them or their projects or not. And in this case, I think she is going to have a very difficult day in front of that inquiry. Uh, Connor's with us. Connor, your take on that? Well, there's absolutely no love loss there at all. Uh, Amar Anwar, the lawyer representing the COVID bereaved, uh, was a one-time very close ally, friend of Nicola Sturgeon, and you heard his words loud and clear there, uh, surrounded by those who lost loved ones during this crisis, uh, saying that Sturgeon stands accused of a betrayal, accusations of the industrial scale deletion, the cynical premeditated decision to delete those messages. That was the accusation from Amar Anwar and raising that prospect once again, as he has done in the last number of weeks, that at the end of the conclusion of today's evidence, that much anticipated evidence from the former First Minister, uh, he will consult with his clients that were surrounding him here around the prospect of putting in a criminal complaint to Police Scotland uh, around the deletion of these WhatsApp messages. What was said in those exchanges with the former First Minister, we don't know. How important were those messages? 
we don't know. Nicola Sturgeon has been clear all along that she did not routinely conduct government business via WhatsApp. But last week, uh, during evidence here in Edinburgh from her, from her former chief of staff, Liz Lloyd, uh, we heard evidence that uh, the two of them had tried to um, orchestrate a rammy with the UK government over furlough to think about something other than sick people. Nicola Sturgeon agreed that would be a possible good idea. There was discussions via WhatsApp between Liz Lloyd, the former chief of staff, and Nicola Sturgeon about potentially tweaking the numbers of people allowed to attend funerals. So how does that square with Nicola Sturgeon's public perception and public facing discussion that she did not routinely conduct government business? I think the word routinely there potentially is doing a lot of heavy lifting. This will not be an easy ride for the former First Minister here today. She faces a lot of questions, not only just on the WhatsApp scandal, but clearly as well about her style of leadership here in Scotland during the crisis. There's accusations that she conducted herself in a presidential style where decisions were taken within a small circle of people and a lot of the cabinet, the wider ministerial group within Scotland were frozen out of those discussions. Did that play a part in how the pandemic played out here in Scotland? We'll find out over the coming hours during this marathon session today and clearly we'll bring that key moment to you live here on Sky News at 10. Okay, for now, thanks very much indeed. Returning to that in just uh, a second. Before I let you go, though, guys, I want to know uh, whether you uh, either United Ireland or Brexit. You choose. I have to pick one of these options. You do. I would rather have a United Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is in a rather similar pattern at the moment. Um, look, the, the weird thing that we've got is that the paper that's going to be published later today, we seem to be making the same mistakes all over again. Like, you, you, you bring forward a paper, we've got Geoffrey Donaldson saying things that simply cannot be true, saying that there will be no checks anywhere, you know, as the goods go in, uh, into Northern Ireland. That just cannot be true. There will be sanitary insights with sanitary checks. Then at the same time, we've got the government saying, we're going to publish a statutory instrument, just this sort of bit of ministerial power. Maybe we'll just push it through this afternoon. Or maybe, you know, tomorrow, but we'll have it all done by Saturday. Have we learned nothing from having a Brexit deal where we, very, we talked a lot of nonsense, forced it through Parliament very fast, and then spent two years trying to unpick the thing because of the mess that it made? It looks like that pattern of behaviour, that culture of a lack of seriousness, seems very much in evidence of what we're seeing today. I think clearly what's been happening behind the scenes is ongoing negotiations between the government and the DUP. And I think Rishi didn't hope with the Windsor framework last spring, that would get the DUP on board. It did not. Jeffrey Donaldson clearly sees something in these changes, which means that finally, after two years, you could have power sharing restored at Stormont. So you do think there has to be something in it. But as Ian points to, I think the, the danger point is the publication of this. And as, as we've seen how difficult these things are to resolve. And ultimately Brexit and you know, they are linked in the sense of... They surely are. You know, when you think about, you know, the problems coming from the Brexit result of how you fix that, um, they've been going on for such a long time. It'd be interesting to see how when you actually have to write it down and there's no, you know, vagueness, um, how these things are really going to work. OK, final thought? The next three days are going to be very interesting and potentially it's actually weirdly dangerous for Rishi Sunak. He can get to the end of it and having actually accomplished something here, and if we get Stormont up and running again, that'd be very impressive. But you look at these three groups, you look at the EU, they seem very relaxed. If they're very relaxed, I would suggest that the DUP and the Brexiters in Parliament should not be particularly relaxed about what's in that document. It all feels quite tense at the moment. When we see it published, the potential for volatility is extremely high. Agree. Okay. Yeah, I think if you can, though, get power sharing back, even as soon as we can, it is a very big achievement. Yes. OK. Uh, truncated today. I'm so sorry about that, but you understand why. It's good to see you. Hopefully we'll see you again next week. Looking forward to it. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Wilfred, standing by. Um, hi, Wilfred. You have that COVID inquiry throughout your show today. We do, by the way, just teasing ahead of that, you mentioned all the Northern Ireland stuff. That's obviously due at about 2pm. We'll have that live on Sky News today. 12 o'clock, we'll have PMQs live. But, yeah, the first couple of hours, all eyes on uh, Nicholas Sturgeon's testimony. I thought that press conference was captivating. You could see the anger and the passion that people hold. Almost more interesting to me, though, Kay, was moments before Nicholas Sturgeon's arrival, she was being heckled. I mean, has a star fallen further in the space of a year of someone who was universally... Uh, almost universally adored in Scotland to, to now having a net negative uh, approval rating. And you can kind of see why. If you set yourself on a pedestal of being 
the principled politician, the one that has attention to detail, and you uh, are seen as deleting these messages. Not that we excuse the fact that Boris Johnson lost a lot of WhatsApp messages, but she labelled him a clown. She tried to claim that she was the opposite. So I think this testimony today, of all of the days of uh, this uh, COVID inquiry, will be particularly fascinating to watch. OK. Wilfred, for now, thanks very much indeed. Busy old day coming up here on Sky News. Of course, we'll cover both of those stories for you, as well as the rest of the breaking news here on Sky. Before that, though, uh, Brexit's back. Ministers are trying to play down concerns as new post-Brexit checks on food, drinks and even flowers come into force, which could push prices and hit British businesses hard. I'm Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world, the likes of Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Sir Elton John. We try to give you an honest sense of how these people really are. There's always more to the news than a headline. We want to discover, to delve a little deeper, to find out what's really going on. Explanation, analysis, the people at the heart of every story. I'm Neil Patterson, and this is the Sky News Daily Podcast. Alex Crawford joining us now from Ukraine. Their personal possessions are all scattered around the place. Our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, try and make sense of uh, the big numbers for us. Things can change incredibly quickly, and that's what they have done. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. Available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> Slightly more, slightly better. Fly Emirates, fly better. Get Brexit done. How many times have we heard that? I thought it was done. Apparently it's not. Adam standing by for us in Brussels. So what's going to happen today, Adam? I mean, so many times we have thought that Brexit was nearly done. I mean, what is it, 2016, the vote, and then uh, since I've been here, we've left the European Union, it feels like a couple of times. Uh, but today, uh, the UK is, having put it off five times, bringing in these new uh, customs rules that effectively mean checks on some food stuff, some flowers uh, coming into the United Kingdom. Uh, these are going to be brought in in stages. So first of all, it's about paperwork. Then later on comes physical checks. But this is, I think, the first sign, Kay, of, of actually how Brexit is going to change 
business life? I mean, you've been hearing already from business owners saying, oh, God, the paperwork, the cost of getting certification. And these are certificates assuring that, uh, let's say, flowers don't have pests uh, in them or that sausages and bacon meet, uh, meet health standards. It's going to add cost. It's going to add uh, bureaucracy. And I think it is worth remembering, uh, remembering that the UK imports an enormous amount of all of these things, sausages, bacon, uh, flowers, and, and also curious things like uh, egg mixed with sugar. That's a really big deal for the baking industry. And those things are now going to require checks. I understand, Adam, and I know you're terribly clever, so you'll be able to explain this to me. Um, how come those little pesky um, mites that were in roses yesterday weren't a problem, but they are today? Yeah, I mean, the truth is, of course, that they were a problem yesterday, they might be a problem tomorrow. But at some point, when you, when you vote for something like Brexit and you say this is about us controlling your borders, then you have to basically start doing it. You have to start saying, this is a border, that's the European Union, we're the United Kingdom, and we can't just have things crossing uh, this border without us checking them. Now, like I said, this has been put off five times. Uh, there are those who think it should have been put off for a sixth. But at, this is the point when the UK says, OK, we are now going to start checking. Now, it, it won't be for months' time that they do physical checks. At the moment, it is about having paperwork, even just random tests, saying, have you got the paperwork to prove that these flowers have been checked for these pesky mites? But at, at a later point, it will be physical checks as well. And that the, these pesky mites is actually a really, really good example, because if you have... A, let's say, a veterinarian who needs to do this certificate. Well, are there enough of them at the moment? Let's say the Italians say they don't have enough of these people to do these environmental health certificate checks. They're going to have to find more of them. That, frankly, is economics will tell you, drives up the price uh, that these certificates will cost. And that, history tells us, is a cost that ends up getting passed on to, to consumers. So the, the, the theory at the moment is that it will end up adding 0.2% to food inflation. Frankly, I suspect that that number uh, has been dreamt up by cleverer people than me, but is going to be subject uh, to revision in the future. OK, Adam, for now, thank you. Let's put some of that to Lisa Mitchinson. She's the owner of the Wild Bunch Florist. Hi, Lisa, good to see you. What impact is all this new paperwork going to have on you? Um, it's going to be really impactful. I mean, it's already been a difficult world since the implementation of Brexit. I mean, I opened my business in 1996 and I've been running it successfully and I import all of my products from Holland because it's not available in the UK. And since the implementation of Brexit and also along that with COVID, my costs have doubled. Not just a percentage, they have actually doubled. Um, okay. Let me put this to you, Lisa, if I may. Sorry to interrupt you, but... Um... Spoke to the minister this morning about this and said, and I actually cited your example uh, and the fact that you get all of your flowers from the Netherlands and it's going to cost you so much more money and the impact it's going to have on your business. And then she basically said, um, buy your flowers from the UK instead. But that, yeah, that would be a great idea and I would love to do that. And I've been making that suggestion for years, but the product just isn't there in the UK. You know, we are geographically in the same location as Holland but we don't support our British growers. You know, everything has to be grown under glass at this time of year. You know, nothing can be grown outside. If you look in your garden, you know, there are no flowers there. So they have to be grown under glass. And we just don't do that in the UK. We don't do it. I would, you know, gladly, um, you know, use British flowers, but they just aren't there. Would it be uh, reasonable to assume that saying it with flowers this Valentine's Day is going to be more expensive? Yes, it is. It always is. But I mean, there's other considerations, you know, the increase in the price of fuel. Um, coal would put a lot of the Dutch growers out of business because they had to destroy all of their flowers. You know, when COVID happened, it was five million euros worth of flowers are being destroyed daily. Lots of people went out of business. So now there isn't a prolific amount of stock available for me to buy. And that just increases the prices, the price of fuel. You know, just to give you an example, um, orchids, which are part of the new legislation, there was a gentleman who grew orchids. He was getting one and a half euros for them on the auction, and it was costing him nine euros to grow it. Whoa. Oh, that goodness. Yeah. Lisa, we're, we're out of time, but thanks, uh, 
for explaining that to us. Do keep in touch and let us know how this impacts on you going forward. Thanks again. Thank um, you hopefully you have a good Valentine's uh, Day sale. Thank you. Oh. Um, Adam, basically, that, that's the sharp end of what this new paperwork means. Uh, exactly, Kate. And I think also what this does is it summarises lots of the pros and cons, lots of the arguments around Brexit, is that if you go back to 2016, we were told that Brexit probably would lead to, to cheaper food, to cheaper products. Well, there's still people who say long term it will do, but also they said it was about intangible things, about sovereignty, about controlling the borders. And that is what you're, you're seeing here. The UK is taking greater control of its borders. And what that means is checking things that are coming uh, into the country. Now, if you're a diehard Brexiter, you'll say that is a good thing. But right now, traders are discovering it probably adds cost to what they're doing. OK, Adam, for now, thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, from 10 o'clock, Nicola Sturgeon is expected to give evidence at the COVID inquiry in Edinburgh in the toughest test of her stewardship of the pandemic so far. A warning, there's some flash photography coming up. Uh, here we go. Here she was uh, arriving at the COVID inquiry this morning. She was jeered, actually, as she came in. The inquiry looks at decision-making between early January and late March of 2020, when the first national lockdown was imposed. And there are some suggestions from the lawyer representing the bereaved families that they could look at um, another criminal investigation, this time related to um, WhatsApp messages. Those WhatsApp messages, I mean, all the parties really are looking at their policies on that and really uh, regretting the way that they use them and indeed the way that many of them have gone missing since, since that crucial time. And the Scottish Government says that the WhatsApp messages were deleted under the Scottish Government's security policy, but then we've had her former Chief of Staff, mm. Liz Lloyd, saying that she didn't know that policy existed. So the, the cause that they attributing to this to isn't a blanket policy. Yeah, she did leave some in place, including suggesting that <laughs> Boris Johnson was a clown. Yes. So let's some wait choice language see. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah let's, <laughs> let's see what happens. Don't forget that you can watch that uh, coverage with Wilfred. Starts in just a few moments' time here on Sky News, live from Edinburgh. We'll see you tomorrow.
A very good morning to you. This is Sky News Today. It's 10 o'clock and coming up in the next few minutes, Scotland's first minister, former first minister, excuse me, Nicola Sturgeon, is to be questioned at the COVID inquiry over her handling of the pandemic. She arrived at the building in Edinburgh earlier this morning and, as you'd expected, uh, photographers were waiting for her, so a warning there is some flash photography accompanying uh, her arrival pictures. <laughs> While Nicola Sturgeon's decision-making is set to come under scrutiny today, with attention widely expected to focus on the deletion of WhatsApp messages. Let's go live to uh, the outside the inquiry in Edinburgh. Our Scotland correspondent Connor Gillis is there for us. Connor, what will be the main focus, do you think, of uh, this part of the inquiry? Well, the stakes are high. Nicola Sturgeon's reputation is on the line. She will be starting to speak in the next uh, few minutes. And this has been an inquiry that's been engulfed in the deletion of the former First Minister of Scotland's WhatsApp. She says that none of those messages related to the pandemic exist. Uh, and in the last few minutes, we've been hearing from the lawyer representing those who've been bereaved by COVID uh, during the crisis. And it was a scathing attack, to say the least, headed up by Amar Anwar, the solicitor representing that group, a one-time ally, a one-time friend. Clearly no love loss there because he said that Nicola Sturgeon stands accused of a betrayal, the industrial scale deletion, the cynical pre-meditated pre -meditated decision to do that. Now, clearly Nicola Sturgeon has been defending her position, saying that she did not routinely carry out government business on WhatsApp and that it was part of a Scottish government policy to, in a timely manner, delete messages as she went along. Uh, some did emerge over the course of last week that had been retained by her former chief of staff, uh, a woman called Liz Lloyd, who'd been part of a powerful duo in Scotland uh, beside Nicola Sturgeon over the years of her premiership here in Scotland. Some of those messages still did uh, exist and uh, I can tell you that in, within those messages uh, there was some discussion around numbers at funerals, there was discussions about uh, trying to create an argy-bargy with uh, Westminster. Let's now go and hear what Nicola Sturgeon has to say. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare Sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. You are Nicola Sturgeon. I am. You've very helpfully provided two statements to this module of the inquiry, as well as a number of other prior statements. Uh, the statements you provided to this module are uh, under reference INQ 000 339033. Uh, this is a statement dated the 6th of November 2023. Is that your statement? It is. Have you signed the statement? I have. Do the contents of the statement remain true and accurate as at today's date? Yes. You also provided a further statement to us under reference INQ 00273980. This was a further statement dated the 16th of November 2023. Is that your further statement? Yes. Have you signed that? Yes. Do the contents of that statement remain true and accurate as at today's date? Yes, I provided some further information to the inquiry last week, uh, which would usefully be read alongside that statement, but yes. Thank you. Some additional documentation rather than changing the text of the statement, I think. Indeed. Thank you. You were the First Minister of Scotland between the 20th of November 2014 and the 28th of March 2023. I was. Uh, you held office as First Minister throughout the period from January 2020 to April 2022. I did. Uh, that is, of course, the period of time with which this module is primarily concerned. As First Minister during that period, you were head of the Scottish Government and so had overall responsibility for Scotland's pandemic response and for engagement with the UK government and other devolved administrations. I did. Could I ask you uh, some questions, please, uh, about uh, the way in which you and others within the Scottish government uh, used informal methods of communication uh, in order to discuss uh, matters uh, connected to the pandemic? Uh, in your statement dated the 16th of November, that's INQ 00273980, at paragraph 48, you say, throughout the pandemic, I sought to be open, transparent and accountable in respect of all decisions being taken. 
while acknowledging some of the issues presented by the sheer pace and magnitude of what we were facing in early 2020, I set out in my Module 2A statement the high degree of formality around Scottish Government decision-making. Decisions were informed, shaped and taken mainly through deep dive sessions, gold discussions and Cabinet meetings. I feel that the nature of the communication that has emerged from the UK Government has created an impression that we were all communicating in such a way. That was not the case, certainly not as far as communications I was party to are concerned. The culture within the Scottish Government during the period in question was serious, formal, purposeful and collegiate. During the pandemic, I did not make extensive use of informal messaging and certainly did not use it to reach decisions. Is it still your position today that you and the Scottish Government were open, transparent and accountable in your actions, not just in your words, at all times throughout the pandemic response in Scotland? Um, yes, that is still my position. Um, openness and transparency with the Scottish public uh, was very important to me from the outset of the pandemic. I communicated uh, to the public on a daily basis for a, a lengthy period of time. Um, we will not have uh, got every decision right and we will have made misjudgments and there will be uh, undoubtedly instances put to me today where on reflection I will think that we could have been more transparent than we were. Uh, but given the nature of the emergency that we were confronted with, building a relationship of trust with the public was important. And in my view then and in my view now, that had to be built on a spirit of openness. Openness and transparency are fundamental concepts in the way in which the Scottish Government uh, seeks to represent the people of Scotland, isn't that right? Absolutely. Um, one can see, as we've seen it in a number of documents, more general documents, but also one specifically related to the pandemic response. For example, the national performance framework, one sees those concepts repeated, I think, in that document. Is that correct? That is correct. And indeed, in documents uh, which we have looked at, which set out uh, the approach which the Scottish Government wished to take to the way in which it was dealing with the challenges of the pandemic. Again, one sees the concepts of openness, transparency, accountability at the very core. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and as far as a role, a very important role that you played was concerned, the public communication strategy, again, these concepts were very much the bedrock, I think, of the way in which you tried to communicate messages, information, decisions to the public in Scotland. That is what I sought to do. Um, you say in the passage we've looked at that you did not use informal communications to reach decisions. What, did you, what do you mean by that? Informal communications uh, were not in any sense uh, an extensive or, or a meaningful part of how I conducted government business in any way, but certainly not to reach decisions. And I would say that in relation not just to COVID, but to government generally. Uh, the number of individuals uh, with whom I would have any uh, informal communication uh, through, I'm talking here about text messages or WhatsApp, yes. uh, would be very limited. Um, in the case of WhatsApp, probably no more than a handful of people. I was never a member of any WhatsApp uh, groups. Mm -hmm. And I think the two people that I uh, would have had the most extensive communication with would have been uh, my former Chief of Staff, Liz Lloyd, and uh, Hamza Youssef. Uh, I believe the inquiry has uh, some messages between me and those individuals, which I hadn't retained, but mm -hmm. uh, they had. And I think they will give a sense of the nature of that communication. Uh, the communication of that nature was not used by me for anything other than routine exchanges, uh, logistics, passing on information. Uh, the exchanges with the individuals I've referred to will be uh, littered with things like, you know, there's a note coming to you through the system. I'm giving you a heads up about that. That's the, the nature of the communication. I, I understand the inquiry may want to explore some elements of that, and I will, of course, answer questions about specifics, but that is the overall nature uh, of that communication, extremely uh, limited. And... Uh, I operated on the basis that I would ensure that anything in communications of that description uh, were otherwise uh, recorded 
on the Scottish Government system uh, if there was anything of that nature. We, we've heard others refer to recording in salient information on the corporate record. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, yeah, so if there were, and this would be rare in my case because of what I've said, I did not do government business uh, through informal messaging um, in relation to COVID or any other matter. Um, but if there were salient points of substance, I would ask myself, is that reflected, recorded in the Scottish Government's uh, record, um, either because I had put it in or it was referring to something that was already on the record if somebody was, as I uh, used as a, an illustration a moment ago, flagging up something that was coming to me through the system. Uh, you know, another example, in my exchanges with Hamza Yousaf, uh, he would, uh, for a period when vaccination was such a focus of all of our efforts, he would send me on a daily basis the, the vaccination uptake figures, uh, which would, within a very short space of time, come to me formally and be published. Uh, so I would check whether uh, there was anything that uh, required to be recorded on the, the Scottish Government system. And I uh, am absolutely uh, firmly of the view that there is nothing, and the inquiry has seen some of uh, these messages, in any informal messaging that I would have been party to uh, that could not uh, have been uh, seen and understood through uh, the formal systems um, and indeed through the public communications that I was engaging in on a daily basis where um, I uh, went through in great detail, some people perhaps thought too much detail sometimes, uh, the issues that we were confronted with and, and dealing with on a daily basis. So just to be clear, to reconcile two parts of your evidence there, you said you didn't use these uh, informal messaging systems, but I think you suggested that there would rarely be occasions when you would have to transpose things onto the corporate record, which suggests that you at least rarely use them. Uh, so, sorry, just to be very clear, I, I have not said, and, and I'm not saying today, that I never used yes. uh, informal means of communication. Uh, what I am saying is that I did so very rarely, and not uh, even more rarely to discuss issues of substance uh, or anything that could be described as decision-making. I, I, I'm sure we'll come on to the, the formal ways in which the Scottish Government took uh, decisions later on, but there was a mm. high degree of formality around the decision-making of the, the Scottish Government. Thank you. Um, you. You mentioned a moment ago that there would be routine exchanges undertaken via these uh, media. Um, do you accept, based on at least the communications we have seen, that um, you, you did uh, undertake discussions around what decisions might be taken through these media? Uh, there would be a, a, an element of reflecting on the decisions that we were having to make. Um, but I was doing that openly in daily briefings uh, with the public. Uh, so I would not be reflecting in any way where I was, um, I suppose, engaging in some secret uh, course of discussion that I wouldn't be sharing openly during that. So, yes, there would be, and I think there have been some exchanges discussed at the inquiry in previous evidence sessions where, uh, you know, I am saying about a particular decision, I'm not sure in my own mind, you know, what the right way to go is. But that would be something that I was trying to formulate in my mind before a formal Cabinet discussion uh, where Cabinet would take the decision. Um, and, you know, that is the extent... Of that, so other exchanges would literally be, um, I think, in the exchanges between myself and, and Hamza Yousaf, uh, things like I, I've, Mr. Yousaf saying to me, I've, I've just been taken, I've just taken part in a Four Nations call. Uh, the note of the readout will be on its way to you if you want me to give you a call to, you know, brief you on that before you get it. I'll do that. So that is the nature of the the communication that I would routinely. And I, again, would say it would be limited uh, that I would routinely have. Thank you. We, we heard evidence, as you may be aware, from uh, one of the directors general within the civil service in Scotland, Ms Leslie Fraser. Um, she was responsible for um, the compilation uh, of a number of different Scottish government policies around uh, information and document retention. And she accepted in her evidence that the primary aim of those policies across Scottish Government 
was to try to make sure that um, a reasonable amount of information was retained in order to be able to give any interested Scottish citizen the material from which, amongst other things, they could deduce how decisions had been taken. Um, do you accept that the messages that, you, uh, that we, we have seen from others contain information that an interested Scottish citizen would like to see in order to uh, understand how decisions were taken in the pandemic? Um, I, for, forgive me, uh, Mr Dawson, if I uh, perhaps haven't seen all of the exchanges. Oh, of, of course. Um, but I, I am not sure I have uh, seen uh, exchanges that have been discussed at the inquiry where I would uh, accept, uh, and it, it may be that I'm showing some today where I do have to accept this, but that I would accept that the interested uh, member of the Scottish public couldn't uh, see the, not just the decisions that were being arrived at in the Scottish Government, but the, the reasoning and the evidence behind those decisions from the public record. Um, I, as I've referenced already and is well known, so I won't labour the point, uh, almost every day during the pandemic, I would openly uh, share with the public the, 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 the state of the pandemic, the uh, difficult choices that was posing for the government, what we were considering in reaching these decisions, what it meant for uh, what we were asking the public to do. So there was a very open uh, form of communication and I, I, I'm not sure I have seen anything that I would say the Scottish public just wouldn't have had any idea that we were talking about that or considering that. It might be a matter for the Scottish public to judge, of, based of course, on all of the information of that was relevant to these matters, whether they felt that they had seen all of the information that they needed to be able to draw conclusions about the appropriateness, timeliness of your decisions. Uh, of course, I, no, I, I, let me uh, be absolutely clear, I, I accept that. And of course, it's for the inquiry to judge uh, whether yes. that is the case. Um, uh, simply uh, sharing my views. Um, but I, again, and I, I, I repeat this because I, I do think it is uh, significant and material. Uh, the, the means of communication, the, the method and the frequency of communication that the Scottish Government was engaging in uh, meant that on a daily basis, it, it was almost an open conversation with the public, which we thought was important to encourage compliance with what the public were being asked to do. Um, so, you know, the, these are public statements and the, the question and answers after it would go through uh, not just the decisions we'd arrived at, but we would go through the, the considerations, the, the balances we were trying to strike, the you know, pretty invidious nature of some of the choices that we were all being faced with then. You referred in the passage from your statement that we went to, um, to the fact that uh, it had emerged publicly through the procedures of this inquiry that a lot of this informal communication had been done within the UK government by WhatsApp in particular, but by other means as well. And you suggested that um, you felt that the nature of the communication as emerged from the UK government has created an impression that we were all commuting, communicating in such a way. Um, we, we have um, fortuitously, by way of example, seen very extensive exchanges between the now First Minister and Professor Leach discussing their attitude to important moments within the pandemic, uh, important decisions they needed to take, important advice they required ultimately to give to you in Cabinet and other fora. Um, it, it appears from that, and indeed the other messages which have now come to light, that informal messaging, in particular WhatsApp, was a frequent part of the way in which the Scottish <coughs> Government conducted its business in COVID. Were you unaware of the fact that that was the case as First Minister during the course of the pandemic? Um, the exchanges you refer to, I would have had no knowledge of and had no sight of uh, before seeing them in the course of this inquiry. If you're asking me, Mr Dawson, would, did I not know that anybody in the Scottish Government was using WhatsApp? Of, of course, that's not the case. WhatsApp had become in my view, probably too uh, common a, a means of communication. Uh, but I think the exchanges you're talking about um, would, certainly from what I have seen, uh, would not suggest that government decisions were being taken through WhatsApp. WhatsApp was a, a means of communication uh, that people were using uh, to exchange information on occasion, sometimes to, to share views uh, about things and and using language uh, and, or rather, ways of describing things that perhaps uh, wouldn't have been done in different forms of communication. One of the, the reasons 
and if I thought this before um, COVID and uh, this inquiry, I, I certainly think it even more strongly now. One of the reasons why I don't believe that WhatsApp, for example, should be used for government communication um, and decision making is that you know, when I make a public statement or when I made public statements as First Minister in this context, I would think very, very carefully mm -hmm. about the words I use to try to minimise as far as is ever possible the scope for what I was saying to be misinterpreted. When people send messages on WhatsApp, they don't think, including me, you don't think that deeply about how you're phrasing things. And therefore, messages, when you, they are looked back at later <coughs> on, can be open to different interpretations because people haven't really thought about the words they're using or the, the, the phraseology that they're using. Um, and I think that certainly would be true of some of the exchanges that the inquiry has been looking at. Would you as First Minister not have thought it to be important that ministers and senior officials would think deeply about the conduct of government business, whether conducted through WhatsApp or otherwise? I, of course, uh, that is the case. And I, in, in saying that, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that people were not thinking deeply. The, the form of, and I think every, every human being probably can recognise what I'm saying, the form of communication can uh, influence the, the phraseology or the way it, in which things are, are worded. Mm -hmm. And informal communication, I think, lends itself to very short, sharp um, exchanges that would be very different if you were making a speech or, or putting something in a formal paper for decision making. Can I you know, say very clearly, um, when I was First Minister, I would not have expected any of my uh, ministers or any of my uh, officials to have been conducting substantive government uh, discussions and certainly not taking government decisions uh, through WhatsApp or other informal means of messaging. Thank you for that. Um, on the 27th of May of 2020, as we covered with uh, Mr Swinney yesterday, in the Scottish Parliament, in response to a question about whether he would order a public inquiry into the COVID-19 outbreak in care homes in Scotland, you replied as follows, of course there will be a public inquiry into this whole crisis and every aspect of this <coughs> crisis, and that will undoubtedly include what happened in care homes. So at that stage, you knew that there would be a public inquiry in the future <coughs> into the Scottish Government's response to the pandemic generally. I always assumed there would be a public inquiry. In, in fact, of course, as we know, you effectively had the and, power to, and, and to order Indeed, an and, and uh, as, as it turned out in Scotland, we have more than, than, than one inquiry, so yes, yes I, I did. Yes. Mm -hmm. On the 3rd of August 2021, uh, Leslie Fraser, who I mentioned a moment ago, and another civil servant whom you'll know, uh, Mr Kenneth Thompson, sent a do not destroy email to Scottish Government officials with the subject COVID-19 independent inquiry record retention explaining the importance of retaining relevant material to the work of the inquiry. Do you recall receiving that email? I do not. Uh, as far as I am aware, I did not receive that. Um, you recall, I would imagine, in a general sense, that, that such, a, such a notification I, was sent out? I, I would say uh, this, that I, I don't think I would have uh, required to see that, to know that uh, matters that were... Uh, relevant to matters of substance, salient, relevant to the inquiry, should be uh, retained. And that, that I had a duty, as all ministers and officials would have had a duty, to ensure uh, that anything that they were exchanging in informal messaging, uh, if they were uh, not retaining those messages in line with uh, the, the policies that were in place, uh, then there would be a clear record of anything uh, on the Scottish Government systems. You said on the 24th of August 2021 at a COVID media briefing given by you that the Scottish Government had started the process of setting up the Scottish COVID inquiry, which we mentioned a moment ago. You stated, I believe that a full public inquiry has a very important role to play, both in scrutinising the decisions we took and indeed continue to take in the course of the pandemic and also in identifying and learning lessons for the future. Uh, do you agree that in order to scrutinise decisions and learn lessons, a public inquiry would need to see not just the decisions themselves, but the discussions that led to the decisions being made or not made, uh, including discussion of information and advice? Um, yes, I, I do agree with that. And uh, what I would add to that, and let me say this is obviously a matter for the inquiry to judge, um, in terms of any 
informal communications I had, which, as I have already said, were limited, both in terms of the number of people and the extent of the, the communication. Uh, there would be nothing in those communications that was not uh, available to either the inquiry or the public through the record of the Scottish Government or indeed in the very detailed uh, public statements that were being made every day. I, and I, I want to uh, assure the inquiry uh, of that, that I take and took very seriously uh, the duty uh, that was on the shoulders of, of me as First Minister and of the Scottish Government collectively to make sure that this inquiry and the corresponding Scottish inquiry uh, would have at its disposal all of the evidence and material that would allow it to assess the decisions and the underpinning reasoning and evidence for those decisions. Um, over the course of the pandemic, and forgive me if I'm getting ahead of your line of questioning, uh, we will no doubt talk about cabinet uh, papers and, and minutes. Over the course of the pandemic, um, I think there would have been in the region of 100 cabinet meetings. For each of those, there would be detailed papers, detailed minutes, that would not just record the decisions that Cabinet reached, but that would look at the different options we uh, assessed and, and discussed, that would narrate the evidence and the reasoning behind the decisions we arrived at. And in Cabinet minutes, would also have lengthy and comprehensive summaries of the, the points made in the discussion around the Cabinet table. Now, I, obviously, that is not all that the, the inquiry has uh, at its disposal, but if it was all that this inquiry had, that would be a comprehensive and very detailed account of every uh, decision that the Scottish Government took in the course of the pandemic. Um, as at May, at least, I think you've indicated already, you're, you are fully cognisant of the fact that there would be a public inquiry, yes? Yes. Um, and in August 2021, you, you announced that there would be one. Yes. Uh, you knew at the time when you made the statement announcing the Scottish COVID inquiry that uh, material uh, which you had used to exchange uh, messages, informal communications, uh, would assist in the very important aims uh, of the inquiry, scrutinising the decisions that you took. Yes. And you knew at that point that those messages had been destroyed. Uh, I had, I knew, yes, that I had operated in line uh, with a policy uh, that I had operated in line with and advice that I had had from the outset of my time as a minister uh, to ensure that uh, conversations with uh, others in government with any uh, impact or, or relationship to government business shouldn't be kept in a phone that could be lost or stolen, but properly recorded. And I was very cognizant of and had been from the start of the pandemic, so not just at the, the points in time uh, that you are referring to, from the start of the pandemic, of my duty to ensure that anything of uh, salience, uh, relevance, substance to the decision-making of the government would be properly recorded through the Scottish Government record. Thank you. Um, you were asked a question by a journalist from Channel 4 um, it, it, where he, he asked you at, at that very press conference in August 2021, Scottish Government has a patchy record of disclosing evidence when asked to do so. Can you guarantee to the bereaved families that you will disclose emails, WhatsApps, private emails, if you've been using them, whatever, that nothing will be off limits to the inquiry? You responded, I think if you understand statutory public inquiries, you would know that even if I wasn't prepared to give that assurance, which for the avoidance of doubt I am, then I wouldn't have the ability. The, he asked specific questions about informal means of communication, including WhatsApps, uh, but you knew by that stage that your WhatsApps had been destroyed. But I also knew that anything of any uh, relevance or substance from any of that material uh, would be properly recorded in the Scottish Government system um, and indeed uh, would have been communicated in all likelihood uh, by me uh, through the, the daily uh, media briefings that I gave. Uh, the importance... Uh, in my view, is making sure that the inquiry has at its disposal all of the evidence underpinning uh, the decisions as well as the decisions we were arriving at. I operated uh, from you know, 2007 uh, based on advice, uh, the policy that uh, messages, business relating to government should not be kept on a 
a phone that could be lost or stolen and insecure in that way, but properly recorded uh, through the system. I, I would want to, again, uh, underline that in, in my case, uh, that communication uh, was extremely limited, and I do not, uh, I, you know, would not relate uh, to matters of substantive government decision making. But that wasn't the question you were asked. You were asked the question as to whether you would disclose emails, WhatsApps, private emails, have been using them, whatever. He didn't ask you the question as to whether the material that was contained within the discussions uh, exchanged by those media was recorded on the corporate record. He asked whether the emails, WhatsApps, private emails, whatever, would be disclosed, and you gave an assurance that they would be. And I, you know, as will have been the case in uh, many occasions uh, over the course of uh, not just the, the COVID pandemic, but in my many years in politics, answering questions when you're answering questions you're trying to answer the substance of the question. And when you look back at the literal terms of the answer, uh, it can be put to you in, in that way. So I accept that and I apologise if that answer uh, was uh, not as clear. Uh, but I also want to be very clear and give the inquiry uh, a, a personal assurance uh, that I am certain uh, that the inquiry has at its disposal um, anything and everything germane to my decision making during uh, the, the process uh, and the, the time period of the pandemic and the factors underpinning uh, those decisions. That has always been important to me um, and it remains important to me, but more importantly than that, it's essential to the scrutiny of the decisions uh, that I will carry the impact of these decisions uh, with me forever. And I want to make sure that those who come after me in politics uh, have the, the benefit of the learning, uh, the things that my government did right and the things that my government did not, that were not right or with hindsight that we wish we had done differently. I cannot uh, say strongly enough how important that is to me. Uh, these decisions were of a magnitude uh, beyond what I had ever experienced, and that is true of decision makers everywhere, and uh, the the impact of them, um, I think about literally every day. And I want this inquiry and the Scottish inquiry to scrutinise those decisions so that we can learn and future governments can learn appropriate lessons from them. In case there's any doubt on the matter, uh, Ms Sturgeon, when I delivered the opening statement in this module, we, we were keen to try to make it clear that our position with regard to those decisions was that they were extremely difficult decisions. Yes, yeah. And there, there, I think there can be no doubt about that. As regards your production of documents, however, you did not produce to us any uh, WhatsApps, messages, or any other informal communications with your first statement dated the 6th of November 2023, despite the request that you do so. Um, I. At the time, for the reasons I have set out, I did not hold um, WhatsApp messages or, or text messages at that point. And I, uh, as I have said, uh, because I had gone through a process of making sure anything of relevance, which would have been very, very limited, I could assure myself would be available through the public uh, record and the, and the Scottish Government uh, record. Um, when I was asked to double check um, when the inquiry uh, sent another uh, request for a statement, um, I discovered uh, an isolated text message with one individual, the then Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, which I uh, provided to uh, the, the inquiry. And I also found, and I again, I apologise to the inquiry because I hadn't uh, at the time thought to look in this place because it would not be a, a normal means of communication. But I, uh, when I was racking my brains to see where I could find anything that might be relevant. I looked at uh, the DM function of Twitter and found there uh, some messages with <coughs> Professor D.V. Schrider and also some very limited messages with Professor uh, Jason Leach, which I then provided to the inquiry. Um, I also uh, sought uh, and was provided through the government with messages uh, between me and Liz Lloyd and Hamza Youssef, which I was aware the inquiry would have from from them, but nevertheless, because I then held them, uh, passed them to the inquiry. Um, there is one exchange um, in the Twitter uh, DM messages with Jason Leach uh, that 
I think gives an indication of my approach to informal messaging, where he is uh, raising something with me. And I think it is the last message in this exchange. I, I, in terms, say to him, if you want to talk about matters like this, come and see me properly. This is not the place to do it. And that was my attitude to that kind of messaging. So was, should we take that to be an instruction to Professor Leach that if he wanted to carry out such conversations where he was discussing important matters related to the pandemic with you, you wanted to be clear to him that that was a matter which was not appropriate for these yes. uh, media. It should be done more formally in person. Discussions was your practice. Hey, absolutely, and, and that was I, I made it clear to him that that was my practice. Um, I think uh, the, the exchange was was related to hospital capacity and, and ventilation mm. uh, facilities in hospitals at an early, a relatively early stage of the pandemic. Yes. Of course, Professor Leach, we know, conducted extensive discussions related to important decisions in the pandemic with others, including the current First Minister. I, as I know you will appreciate, I have only seen exchanges that have been uh, explored at uh, previous evidence sessions, so I cannot talk in any way about the totality of those messages. Yes. Um, I have not seen, to the best of my knowledge, um, anything that would suggest he was engaging in decision-making. Um, there are exchanges, uh, conversational exchanges. Uh, it's you know, many of these exchanges uh, that I have seen, uh, and from other governments as well. I think on WhatsApp would be exchange, the kind of exchange that had people not been working uh, remotely and been in the same building as I actually was with uh, key advisors and uh, throughout the pandemic. These are the kind of conversations that would have happened verbally, mm. face to face, and end up being <coughs> translated to WhatsApp because of the nature of people's working environments. Given the fact that you were in St Andrew's house, I think, quite a lot of the time, as we heard from Ms Freeman, uh, as she was, um, there were a large number of those verbal conversations between you and others, like Ms Freeman, who are based predominantly there during the pandemic. Isn't that right? Uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the majority of the conversations uh, that I would be having with uh, certainly Ms Freeman uh, and uh, the Chief Medical Officer uh, at the time and, you know, other uh, senior advisors would be face-to-face -face in St Andrew's House. I uh, was in St Andrew's House from very early in the morning till very late at night, uh, almost every day uh, for an extended period of time, as were these other individuals. I think Ms Freeman did say seven days a week you are uh, all For a much. period, seven days a week, yes. yes. Um, were the salient points of those verbal discussions uh, committed to the corporate record? Uh, yeah, so at my private office were also, uh, or uh, not my entire private office, but key individuals in my private office, and they would have a rota, there would be somebody from my private office uh, in the building with me. Um, so salient points uh, would be uh, recorded as appropriate and, and fed through the system. I think perhaps if, if I may, there's, there's two further points uh, to be made there. If I, as First Minister, I'm having a discussion with anybody that then requires action to be taken, if that's not re uh, inputted to the system, action won't be taken. That is how uh, conversations turn into to actions that uh, are necessary. The second point is just to reflect, um, particularly in the very early stages of the pandemic and in the early stages of, uh, well, certainly through March uh, and into April 2020, there was a frenetic pace of decision making. Um, and we were taking decisions at very uh, short notice. Uh, we were the situation was changing uh, several times a day, uh, and we were all working at pace. Um, you know, I would have conversations uh, in the morning that by the afternoon, the situation had changed, and so the nature of, of those conversations would be different. And I think it's, you know, three, four years on, it is difficult sometimes to appreciate just how frenetic uh, the pace of activity was at that time. The fact that you're working at pace, though, doesn't alter the obligation to make sure that salient points of conversations and messaging are on the corporate record. Oh, no, absolutely. But, for example, I remember on the 23rd of March 2020, the day uh, that we entered what became known as 
as lockdown, uh, having conversations, uh, the, because the advice uh, that was coming uh, at that point was that we uh, required uh, very strict measures to suppress uh, the virus at that stage. The measures that had been introduced previously weren't bringing the R number down sufficiently. Uh, I remember having conversations with Ms Freeman, the Chief Medical Officer at the time. Um, we then, of course, went into COBRA um, and those decisions were formalised through the COBRA meeting and they'd be recorded uh, that way. So I suppose what I'm saying is the ways in which these, these conversations would become decisions and then be recorded was perhaps uh, different in the, the environment we were in at that point than would be the case in normal times and, and normal government business. Whereas with these verbal conversations, it, it wouldn't be possible for us to work out whether the salient points of those had been transcribed to the corporate record, because although we might have the corporate record, we don't know what the conversations were. In contradistinction, we do now have some messages, so we could compare the corporate record to those messages and work out for ourselves whether the salient points had been transcribed. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm absolutely sure that you would be able to take messages and go to the corporate record, go to the public statements that were made at the time and see all of that reflected. It may not be the case that in every instance you will see, you know, conversation between uh, on this date uh, and the, the reference in, on the corporate record tying those up absolutely. But I am absolutely certain that the salient points that we were discussing then uh, would be reflected on the corporate and indeed on the public record. These were, by their very nature, these were decisions that could not be kept secret, even if we had wanted to, which we didn't, because these were decisions that uh, were asking the public to do things or more regularly not to do things that had to be communicated. Uh, they were also decisions that had uh, you know, very significant impacts for the private sector, for the public sector, for society as a whole. They had to be recorded in a way that they could be actioned and communicated clearly, quickly and effectively. That may apply to the decisions themselves, that they couldn't be kept secret because also ultimately the public found out about them, the restrictions and everything. However, the discussions relating to the decisions and how they had been reached could, it would appear, be kept secret. Um, well, I, again, I, I would like to give a, an assurance to the inquiry that contrary to any, to, to there being any desire on the part of me or my government to keep things secret, I would, I, I would suggest that the opposite uh, was the case during the pandemic. We went to great lengths uh, to communicate not just the decisions. I, I, I took a view very early on in the pandemic, uh, it's for others to judge whether it was right or wrong, that if we were to achieve a level of compliance with the restrictions that we were placing the country under, then it was important that the public didn't just know what we were asking them to do, but why we were asking them to do it, and what the reasoning was that had taken us to those decisions. And that's what I sought to do, sometimes effectively, perhaps sometimes not so effectively, on a daily basis. So there was, we were not having discussions that weren't then being communicated to the public openly. In the nature of not just government, but, but life generally, you know, it is not possible to record, and I'm not even sure it's desirable to good governance, uh, if I may say that, to record every single word that is uttered in a conversation in government. There, there needs to be in government, and I think this is in the interest of good governance, the ability for ministers uh, with each other or ministers with advisers to, to have an open, you know, thinking out loud discussion before getting to the point of a proposal, let alone a decision. Um, but salient points about why we were taking decisions and what those decisions were, absolutely, uh, to go back to, I think, the question you, you initially put to me, Mr Dawson, Absolutely. I firmly am of the view that they will all be uh, discernible from the corporate government record and indeed over and above that, the public record. You subs we subsequently learned from uh, your second statement that you had used uh, means of various informal means of communication for some messaging with uh, Mr. Youssef, Ms. Lloyd, Mr. Swinney, Ms. Freeman, Dr. Calderwood, Dr. Smith, Professor Leach. Ken Thompson, Leslie Evans, Professor Sridhar, 
the First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, and the former Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, Michelle O'Neill. Is that correct? Uh, yes. You produced no messages with any of these individuals with your, with your first statement. Is that correct? Yes. But as I also say in the statement, um, those messages would have been extremely limited. If I uh, take John Swinney, for example, uh, it has never been our practice, um, not just during the pandemic, but generally to text. I don't think I've ever WhatsApped John Swinney, um, and certainly if I have, it would be the exception, uh, absolutely the exception. Uh, but text messages would be very occasional. And the nature of the text messages that I would have with John Swinney would be, uh, are you free to speak? Or um, can I pop in? to see you. Uh, it's just never been in the nature of it. With some of the others, Catherine Calderwood was one of those who was in St Andrew's House with me. The, the number of people in, in the Scottish Government, the, however many thousands of people work in the Scottish Government that I hold a mobile phone number for is extremely limited. Mm. It was not my method of communication with Mark Drakeford uh, and Michelle O'Neill. These are uh, you know, discussions with other uh, government leaders that would have been recorded through the, the normal systems. Um, so I, again, want to be very clear that it was not my practice to not just not take decisions through informal messaging, but have substantial uh, or lengthy or detailed discussions about uh, government decisions through these means. It's not my style, it's not my practice, it's never been my practice not least because I don't think it is a good or effective or helpful way of, of reaching decisions, not just taking decisions, but it's not a helpful process in reaching decisions either. WhatsApp messages between yourself and Mr Yusuf and Ms Lloyd were produced by you with your second statement. Where did you get them? Uh, they were provided uh, to me through the Scottish Government. You, you obviously didn't have those on your own devices because no. you deleted them, hadn't you? I didn't retain them in line with the, the, the procedure I've already talked about. Are you creating a distinction between deletion no, and retaining? No, no. Um, you had deleted them, had you not? I, I think de deletion, I think, um, forgive me, I, I think sounds as if it was a sort of, uh, you know, not bothering to check whether I, any information was being retained. I was very thorough, and not just in the pandemic, but in all my work in government to ensure uh, that things were appropriately appropriately recorded, but in line with the advice I'd always been given since my first day in government properly, probably, was not to retain mm. uh, conversations like that on a phone that mm. could be mm. lost or stolen and therefore not secure. But did you delete them? Uh, yes. And as far as the other messages are concerned that you couldn't produce yourself uh, between you and all these others, you deleted all of those as well? In the manner that I've... Uh, and after the process that I have set out, yes. You also produced some um, direct Twitter messages that you've already mentioned with um, Professor Leach and Professor Sridhar. Professor Sridhar also produced those messages to us, although slightly later than you, at the beginning of December. Did you have any discussions with her about the production of those messages? Um, I think I let her know that I'd found messages and would be providing them to the inquiry. So there was contact between you and her related to the messages? I, I simply as a courtesy to let her know, yes. Could I have a look, please, at INQ 0027766? We're both being admonished, I think, Ms Sturgeon, for speaking too quickly for the stenographer. So I, if we can both try and speak a little more slowly, that'd be very much appreciated. Um, this is, uh, these are some extracts from messages uh, between yourself and Ms Lloyd. I'm starting with the one on the 27th of October 2020, 7.10. Um, so just reading through them, it says, I'm having a bit of a crisis, this is you speaking, I'm having a bit of a crisis of decision making in hospitality, not helped by the fact I haven't slept. The public health argument says stick with six uh, PM slash NO alcohol, no alcohol for level three, but I suspect industry will go mad and I worry we could derail debate, though I suspect that won't happen and we could commit to listening and changing if we felt necessary. To which Ms Lloyd replies, replies, my instinct is 6 PM. That's the same as Central Belt now, but some more places open. They have offered further mitigation, so we work with them on delivering those extra mitigations and review at that point. She then follows up, the only alternative would be 8pm, but no alcohol. Restaurants would like you for that. 
to which you say it's the same as non-central belt places can open, but only for food, non-alcohol, 8 p.m. would be better. I guess that I guess, but not sure we can make much of a public health argument for 8 p.m. alcohol at level two, and 8 p.m. no alcohol at level three. Ms. Lloyd replies, that's why I would stick with 6 p.m. But if you want to compromise, it'd be about giving people regulated places to be in the winter rather than unregulated homes. But no alcohol, because it changes behaviour. The difference from now would basically be it's colder and it's darker, so people will be less likely to be outside. You say, OK, we should prob, prob stick with six. It's also random, but I think we need to be prepared for a bit of backlash. I've also queried whether we really need the last entry times, and if we do, if we should give uh, on 9.30 slash 10.30, as it stands, there's nothing we can point to to say we've listened to industry. Ms Lloyd replies, level two, 8 p.m. is listening to, 8 p.m. is listening to them. And then she follows up, and the whole allowing restaurants and pubs to stay open you say, I, propose, I suppose, and then she says, there's quite a lot recently. I mean, they'll still be grumpy, but there it is, I think it's meant to say. Um, this is an example of a messaging exchange that would be relevant to uh, someone who would be interested in knowing how decisions in this regard had been arrived at. Uh, yes, but I, I, in many respects, I think this uh, exchange illustrates uh, the answers I've been giving you for, for context, and uh, I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, um, but I think this is 7.20 on the morning of the 27th of October 2020. That's I think correct. I was on my way to a cabinet meeting. I would be in the car uh, from Glasgow. Um, these would be decisions that cabinet was about to arrive at, and I am simply talking about the things that I would then go into cabinet and we would talk about and then would be recorded through the cabinet minutes um, and the decisions that we took. I was probably later that day standing on a public platform uh, talking about some of the, 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 the decisions that we'd faced, the options that we had and why we had arrived at the decision uh, that we have arrived at. There's, a, I can't see it Right now, there's a, a reference in there to I have queried. That's a reference. That's something I had obviously fed in as a, uh, a question to the advisors who would have been preparing the cabinet, the cabinet uh, minute uh, papers. So, in a sense, I I look at this, and I don't consider that there is anything in that that wouldn't be reflected through the decision making. Uh, and the evidence of the decision making of the government and undoubtedly uh, hospitality and the impact of hospitality, the, uh, the uh, different time limits, that was all uh, very, very much to the fore in public discussion at the time. And I am certain that I would have been talking openly about some of these uh, choices and the fine balances of the, the very difficult decisions that we were having to take. Will we find on the corporate record or some other public record that your position was we should probably stick with six. It's all so random. But that's the, the the message exchange. Mr. Dawson starts with, um, and again, I, I I said earlier on the reason I don't think WhatsApp messages uh, should be used to have substantial government discussions is because we can look at them for almost four years later, and and they're open to different interpretations. That message exchange that you read out uh, started with me. You know, perhaps uh, this is the kind of thing I, I would prefer not to be on the public record, having a crisis of decision making. It, you know, perhaps is not what I wanted uh, <coughs> people to, to to know, and that I hadn't slept. I, at the 27th of October, uh, 2020, uh, wouldn't have had a day off in since, you know, much much earlier that year before uh, March. Um, and had been working. I'm not saying that for sympathy. That, is, that was my job and my duty. Um, and there were moments in that where the decisions that we were taking felt almost impossible, that whatever we did, uh, we would cause difficulty and harm to, to somebody uh, somewhere. And so a phrase like, it's all so random, that probably simply reflects how I felt at 7.20 that morning uh, when I hadn't had much sleep uh, but by the time I got to Cabinet, I'm sure that I would have collected my thoughts and that we then had a proper discussion and reached a decision that was properly recorded um, with a good uh, and robust process around it. This is a discussion related to an important decision made during the course of the management of the pandemic. That would have then been discussed at Cabinet and recorded through uh, 
and you, you've seen all the minutes of of the cabinet, but the, the minutes of of the cab of, of all cabinet meetings, they don't just record the the decision we arrive at. They will record if there's a paper given different options. They will record that, and they record uh, a summary, a pressy of the the discussion and the points made in these discussions. Does that record record that your position was as it stands? There's nothing we can point to to say we've listened to industry. I, I, I would um, reg. So I, I don't have the, the the cabinet minute from that date um, in front of me, but I absolutely am certain uh, that around this point in particular, um, I will have uh, spoken not just uh, in cabinet meetings but publicly about uh, the need to listen to industry. Uh, to listen to different groups uh, in Scottish society uh, as we arrived at the decisions. We were trying to take decisions that none of us wanted to be taking, uh, and we were trying to reach those decisions in a way that we thought st struck the right balance. I'm sure we'll come on to talk later on about the four harms approach that the Scottish Government took. And in that, we were listening as much as, as we could to different viewpoints. Uh, we were not always able to take account of those viewpoints because of the nature of the decisions. So, you know, I am absolutely certain that it would have been uh, not news to anybody that we were struggling uh, with the impact on industry of some of these decisions and that we were at pains to show that we, as far as we could, given the nature of the decisions that we were taking, we were listening to reasonable points that were being made. Do you think that an interested member of Scottish society or indeed this inquiry, should take no interest at all in the process by which this decision is made and this discussion's role in it, including the fact that you say it's all so random. There's nothing we can point to to say we've listened to industry. Ms Lloyd's response, Ms Lloyd's involvement in the discussion, either generally or in relation to this specific issue. Oh, no, I, I, I'm not saying the inquiry should have no interest um, in that. On, on the contrary, I think the inquiry does have an interest in this, and I think the wider Scottish public uh, would. What I uh, am saying is I do not uh, accept that it would have been unknown to the public at the time that these were the issues we were grappling with. Um, every day I was taking the public through the different issues that we were grappling with, the, the balances we were trying to strike, the trade-offs that we were having to make, and the different viewpoints that we were trying as best we could to balance. So, you know, in a sense, this is an example of an exchange that, you know, we look at it now in a, a WhatsApp, but I, I don't consider that there is anything in that exchange that would not have been known that was either on the, the record and through the cabinet minutes or in public statements that these were exactly the kind of issues we were trying to reach, uh, considered uh, and balanced judgments on. Thank you. Um, could I take you to another document, please? This is INQ 00026801.7. This is a, a, another exchange. This is, in a, this is not a group that features you, but it's a, another piece of evidence that we've seen. And I, I'd be interested in understanding your reflection on some of the content of the exchange. This is um, in your capacity as the former First Minister and First Minister at the time. This is in a WhatsApp group chat called COVID Outbreak Group. These uh, messages were provided to the inquiry by uh, Dr. Jim McMenamin of uh, Public Health Scotland, who did not delete his messages, uh, and not by the Scottish Government or its officials. In the exchange at uh, 27th of August 2020, uh, you'll, you'll recognise, no doubt, the individuals involved. Uh, Ken Thompson says, just to remind you seriously, this is discoverable under FOI. Know where the clear chat button is, to which Nicola Stedman replied, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Jason Leach uh, points out DG level input there. Uh, Mr. Thompson says plausible deniability are my middle names. Now clear it again. Uh, Jason Leach says done. Nicholas Stedman, me too, and someone called Donna Bell and me. Um, were you aware in your capacity as First Minister that these sort of exchanges took place and that a senior member of the civil service considered plausible deniability? to be his middle name? Um, I, as you 
uh, said at, at the outset of the question, I was not a member of this group I've, of until some of these exchanges were uh, explored in evidence sessions last week. I had never seen uh, these messages before. Did I know that there would be WhatsApp groups where officials were exchanging in information? I'm not sure I was particularly conscious of it, but I would have, uh, had I been asked to stop and consider that, I would have said, well, I, I would assume so, given the nature of how people yes. were working. Um, I would absolutely expect all officials in the Scottish Government uh, to retain, in line with Scottish Government policies, information uh, relevant to our decision making. Um, I look at that exchange and I, I, what I don't see is an exchange about you know, the, the decisions we're taking. I see a, a light-hearted uh, discussion between uh, officials. Ken Thompson, I know, has been before you and has given his uh, interpretation of that, so you know, he, he can answer and has answered for himself. I would read that as him reminding people of the need to be professional um, on WhatsApp, uh, even when discussing light-hearted things. The other thing I would say about all of these individuals on the screen before me um, is that they are all, in my uh, knowledge and experience, and with some of them, particularly Ken Thompson, uh, this is extensive experience. They are public servants uh, of the utmost integrity. Um, and at this point and throughout the pandemic, uh, they were public servants who were working in a, a committed and a dedicated fashion uh, in terms of the hours and the pr they were working the pressure under which they were working above and beyond probably uh, the call of duty. Um, Ken Thompson is somebody I've worked with throughout my time in the Scottish Government and he is a, a civil servant, as I say, of the utmost integrity uh, and the utmost professionalism. This uh, group was called Covid Outbreak Group obviously connected to the COVID pandemic, yes? Uh, if assumes. that is what you're telling one, me, yes. One assumes, yes, that is the name of it. One yes. assumes, therefore, it's to do with COVID outbreak group, mm -hmm. to do with COVID, and therefore uh, relevant to the pandemic. Um, what Mr Thompson does here uh, is that, despite recognising that material in this uh, chat is discoverable under freedom of information legislation, is to tell other individuals in the group that they should clear it or delete it. Is that not correct? Uh, that is what is in front of me, yes. Could I just go a little bit further down, please? Just, I'm, I'm just tracing the messages down to um, 16, 17, so very shortly after um, the exchange that we've had. There, at 16, 17, so this is just a, a couple of minutes after, further down, you can see in the background other uh, what happens in between. Um, there is something which Jason Leach says at 16, 17, which is redacted. And then Ken Thompson says, the information you requested is not held centrally. Um, is that a phrase you recognise? Of course it is, yes. Is that a phrase which often appears in freedom of information requests uh, when uh, documentation is requested from the Scottish Government? Yes. Uh, is it a phrase which indicates, uh, as a result of a request, the Scottish Government is not in a position to be able to provide the information it might otherwise because it doesn't actually hold the information in yes. its central repository? Yes. Does it look to you that this is Con Ken Thompson suggesting that that response is an excuse often trotted out by the Scottish Government in response to freedom of information requests? Um, I absolutely accept that's an interpretation that can be put on it. I, uh, it, it. These are not my words. Of course. This is not an exchange I'm involved in, so there is a limit to how far I can go in trying to interpret what uh, he meant by that. In looking at the exchange, my interpretation of it, which may or may not be correct, is that he is reminding uh, the others on the, um, in the chat uh, that the kind of things they are talking about, they probably shouldn't be on a, a chat like this. You know, somebody says, I was a nippy teenager in 1986, for example. That's the nature uh, of that. Um, again, all I can repeat about Ken Thompson is that he is a civil servant, in my experience, who took the uh, responsibilities around recording um, and uh, making sure that the government record uh, was complete extremely seriously. He's uh, one of the civil servants in my experience that was not just most experienced in that, but that uh, was most assiduous in that side of things. So I can't uh, answer uh, for him. I can speak uh, about my experience of uh, him and I can give an interpretation based on the context of that, that that was meant to be a light-hearted comment, um, but that is only my interpretation. For, forgive me, the, the other thing I would, I would say, I, uh, like many people, given 
and I can reflect back to this time, our discussions in government were very serious. There are times when they were extremely sombre. There were days when they were very, very dark, uh, given the nature of what we were dealing with. And because the public as a whole were going through unimaginable trauma at the time, many of them still living with that trauma, reading now light-hearted light exchanges, I think, can be very difficult because it, it gives an impression that people were not taking the situation seriously. That could not be further from the truth. I think what you have there are public servants who were working incredibly hard to take the best decisions, to support ministers to take the best decisions to keep people safe, who were you know, perhaps, as is human nature, occasionally engaging in light-hearted light comment to try to probably get themselves through the day. That's my interpretation of what's before me, but I appreciate uh, others may arrive at a different one. If it were ultimately to, 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 to be determined that there was a culture of plausible deniability, a culture of uh, deleting uh, messages that would be recoverable under FOI requests, um, a culture of suggesting in order to get out of FOI requests that documents are not held centrally. Uh, these would be abhorrent Absolutely. revelations, would they not? Absolutely. And, and to be very clear, that is not uh, the culture uh, that uh, I uh, believe existed in the Scottish Government uh, during my time as First Minister, or indeed uh, in my time as Deputy First Minister. And if those things were deemed to be the reality of your time, the culture in your time as First Minister, that would be a serious breach of the bond of trust between the government and the Scottish public, which we discussed as being very much at the cornerstone of your whole approach. If, if that was the case, and, and let me yes. repeat, it is not my view that it was, then yes, what you're putting to me would be true. I would, again, and, and you will take me through, no doubt, lots of documentation later, uh, but that single page, and I'm, I'm sure there will be other pages of WhatsApp messages that you could put in front of me, I would counterpose to the, you know, in the region of 100 cabinet papers and minutes that properly seriously recorded uh, the decision making and the, the underpinning rationale for the decision making of the government. The bond of trust between any government and the public at any time is of paramount importance. Um, but this was particularly the case during the extraordinary um, an unprecedented situation we faced in the pandemic. And it was, it was something I felt uh, to my core um, every single day of that. Um, we saw in um, messages that we looked at in some detail with Professor Sridhar that you had um, suggested to her that she might contact you by, I, via either your SNP email address or your government email address. <laughs> um, was the suggestion that she might use your SNP email address an appropriate thing to have done in the conduct of your um, <coughs> government business? Um, it, it, in reflection, perhaps I shouldn't have done that, but if I had been trying to direct her <coughs> to a, an, a personal email, SNP or otherwise, to keep something off the government system, then I, I would suggest I wouldn't also have given her my government email address. I, I wasn't, and uh, obviously the, the inquiry has looked at that <laughs> message, I wasn't pushing her in one direction or the other. What I was saying this was, uh, I, I think, from memory in, in June 2020 or thereabouts, uh, at still a very, very uh, tough, critical phase of the pandemic. Effectively, what I was saying to her is, if there are things you think I should know, don't stand on ceremony. I'd rather know. And at that point, I was, as I think any responsible decision maker should have been, I was trying to deepen my knowledge. I was trying to learn as much as I could about the virus and how to combat the virus. I, I was desperate to understand different perspectives. I was desperate to understand as much as I could from the experiences and the responses of other countries. Now, let me be very clear, the bulk of that was coming to me through uh, Scottish Government advisors. But I had a thirst to understand as much as possible. And I simply wanted uh, her. She was somebody who had been appearing in the media a lot. I was periodically asked about views that she had been expressing in the media. And I wanted to have an understanding, a deeper understanding of, of what they were. But if I'd been in any way trying to direct her to a private email address, I, I doubt if I would have put my government email address in there as well. Um, 
And of course, the context of what we were talking about was, I think, a paper that she was sharing with the wider advisory group. At no point did uh, Professor Schrader send me anything that was, you know, for my eyes only, that wasn't either publicly available information or information that was being shared with the advisory group she was a member of. I think we have seen some emails now that were very recently produced to us by the Scottish Government uh, between yourself and Professor Sridhar, um, which do, I think, as the, the, te the direct message exchanges suggest, indicate that she was forwarding on to you policy papers, which I think your position is that those would otherwise have been made yes. available to you. Is that right? Do, have I got that right? Yes, they, they, these were, she was a member, and yeah, I know the inquiry is aware of this, she was a member of the Scottish advisory Government yeah. COVID-19 advisory group, um, and these were papers she was preparing for the group. What the group did with them, or what uh, weight it gave to them, that would be for the group to answer, but these were not things that she was sending, preparing for mm. me and sending to me alone. They were simply copies of things that were in wider circulation. It would, one assumes, be in accordance with the normal practice of the group, that the group would decide whether that needed to be sent to you rather than Professor Sridhar, isn't that right? Uh, possibly yes, but at that point, and if, if, this, if this was the wrong approach to take, Mr Dawson, I apologise. At, at that point, in dealing with an unprecedented situation and a pandemic, I wanted to understand as much as I could. I wanted my decisions to be as informed as possible. I read um, perhaps... One of the reasons why in the early exchange I was saying I hadn't slept much, I, I, I read extensively from public sources of articles and, and research studies online. I was trying to understand as much as possible and as, as quickly as possible. And I, I took the view if somebody could help me with that, if somebody could send me something that I would otherwise see, but I, I might see. I, I'm, I'm not even sure, with my apologies to her, that I would have necessarily read everything she, she sent me because I might already have seen it or I would perhaps not think it was particularly relevant. But I, I had a desire to have as much information in order to deepen my understanding of the situation we were facing as, as I could. And, and while there are things we may talk about today where I think if I was to go back and have my time again, I would take a different decision. Mm. I hope I wouldn't take a different decision on that. It was important to me to be as informed and as educated as I possibly could be. You used a personal phone for the conduct of government business while First Minister, is that correct? Uh, I, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, you never used a government-issued phone, is that right? Mm. We've heard evidence from a variety of ministers that they seem to use phones from a variety of different sources, some Scottish government, some personal, some Scottish parliament issued phones. Is it appropriate in your view as the former first minister that ministers are conducting business on phones that are not government issued phones? Um, it was never suggested to me at any time during uh, my period as First Minister, that it was not appropriate. The reason I used a, a personal phone was that I, I didn't want to have multiple devices. Um, a government phone, I wouldn't have been able to do uh, constituency business or party or personal matters. And, you know, on a constituency one, I can do the other. So you, you get the picture here. Yes. So I wanted to have one device. It was never suggested to me that was inappropriate. Um, and I don't believe it was inappropriate. Um, I think any phone, whether it is personal parliament government is vulnerable to being you know, left on a train or, or lost somehow, which goes back to points I made earlier on about the, the practice and the policy around how information is retained in government. Um, we've been made aware of an article which appeared in the press just yesterday suggesting that um, your expenses claims indicated that on the 19th of March you purchased a phone and a number of SIM top-ups and the article also suggests that you purchased a second prepaid phone in between 2020 and 2021 because it's based on your expenses claims, I think, and the, the amounts are, are there. Um, why did you, did you purchase those phones and why did you? Um, they were purchased uh, certainly through my expenses on my authority. I didn't mm. personally purchase them. They were also not for use by me. Uh, many MSPs, I believe, did the same. Uh, when the pandemic uh, started, and uh, my constituency office staff could no longer work. Could I, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Urgent. Just to be clear, I'm, we're obviously keen on understanding whether they were used for your business related to the COVID uh, pandemic in the uh, conduct of your role as First Minister. They were not. I, used if by they were used for some other purpose, we have no interest. They, in. they were the phones that my constituency office landline were diverted to in the homes of my constituency office staff. I have never 
uh, to the best of my knowledge, seen, held and certainly not used uh, any of these phones. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, Milady, as I'm about to move on to a different topic, if that's an appropriate moment. Certainly. Um, I suspect uh, um, we may be getting messages that the stenographer is struggling. Um, I yes. appreciate it. it's very difficult to change no, one's course. pattern of speech, but um, maybe if you paused before asking the next question, um, Mr Dawson, so the stenographer can catch up. I'll try my very best, right. Milady, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Half past 11. There is the first break in the proceedings of the uh, UK COVID inquiry uh, uh, Edinburgh module that has uh, been continuing, of course, uh, over the course of the last uh, two to three weeks. Nicola Sturgeon, the former First Minister, giving her evidence uh, today. She uh, uh, said that anything of salience to the operation of government uh, would have been properly recorded, recorded and she was very cognizant of that, uh, referring to the fact that while... She did not say that she never used WhatsApps for government business, that she very rarely did, uh, and any WhatsApps that were used for government business, she said, would have been recorded directly and passed on to the COVID inquiry. Of course, that has been the gist of the questions this morning, given that a huge swathe of her WhatsApps have been uh, deleted. She was pretty clear uh, that she felt that her WhatsApps weren't used for government business. So let's bring in our Connor Gillis who is watching uh, and listening attently and has been doing so throughout.